Hello and welcome to another episode of Video Game Logic. Today's show was recorded on May the 23rd, 2017. I'm your host, gaming psychologist, and with me, as always, with a special surprise today. <laughs> Caffeine Rage. On today's show, we will, of course, be discussing the games that we played. I got a VR headset, and I'm going to talk about it. Valve hires Kerbal Space Program's crew. Goddess is an ongoing project, according to 22Can's CEO. More Life is Strange is going to be coming our way. We'll have our weekly community corner and our Steam weekly discovery queue. And as long as I don't forget one, timestamps will be in the show notes <laughs> following their respective topics. Yeah, sorry to throw you a little bit under the bus. That was more for me to uh, uh, to remind me. That is not a timestamp. Delete that whenever I was yeah. copying and pasting everything. Yeah, I and guess I forgot I, to remove that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I must have just forgot when I was editing it. Yeah, I'm sorry about it. that. I, it was more just... <laughs> It's like, wait a minute, that's not a timestamp. <laughs> no, it's funny. I chuckled. I was like, well, that probably got copied over. That's funny. No, no, that's why that note was there, was so it uh, didn't get copied over. Did you actually go look up the timestamp or just leave it no, blank? No, I just left it blank. That's on you. Fair enough. Because honestly, uh, me hunting down the timestamp is a pain in the ass because I use Winamp. Mostly because it whips the llama's ass. Uh... <laughs> Uh, but uh, because I guess Winamp was designed not with a long form content in mind, so anything that goes beyond an hour uh, is sixty one minutes, sixty two minutes, sixty three, and I'm not going to bother. Yes, uh, figuring out the hour marks. Yeah, that I have gotten to the point where I'm just like, yep, this many minutes is this many hours, and like I'm giving seconds in my head for whenever I make the video because in Windows oh, and I'm movie, fine by the way. A little pissed off, but eh. Did I ask you how you were this week, or did we just jump into no. a conversation? Okay. <laughs> how are you doing this week, Rage? Uh, more than a little angry, but eh. Yeah, I know, I know why, but I mean, you don't have to share uh, that. Oh, you I don't texted want to. you why. Uh... Yes, you did. Yes, you did, and I felt very bad for you. That sounded kind of condescending. I don't mean it in a condescending <laughs> way. You know what I mean. Yeah, well, I could only imagine uh, what you said or uh, thought whenever you saw that text message from me. Um, it, I thought, it, was those bastards again? It, it, it took me half a day just to cool off enough to actually sleep. I, it was one of those things that I, uh, you're, uh, I was tired, but I was so worked up and just yeah. pissed off that I would lay down and I would just stare at the fucking ceiling. And fume. Nothing has ever made me that mad in, in my life except for my marriage. <laughs> well, let's just put uh, it this way. Uh, yeah, what was supposed to be my medical ordeal ending yesterday? Uh, it continues. Indeed. And I'm very and sorry. And this was for that. after, yeah, being delayed already about two months. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really sorry about that, buddy. I mean, I know it's not my fault, but it still sucks. And, you know, therapists and all that, I'm I'm here with you. Yeah, I mean, I'm just glad my issues aren't life-threatening. Because, yeah. fuck. Yeah. Yep. And it's probably only going to get worse. Well, because of them well, their Medicare cuts. Well, technically, I guess it's not life-threatening. I mean... Uh, as pissed off as they make me, maybe I'll just, you know, burst an artery and, you know, just fall over dead. Just have an getting, aneurysm. Yeah, just getting uh, so pissed off. Hope that doesn't happen. I wonder if, uh, well, I guess uh, I, I couldn't sue in that case because, you know, I'd be kind of dead, but still. I think I could sue. Because, like, I mean, we make a little money on this show, which <laughs> technically I could argue that that's a business, and they killed my business partner, so... I would have to sue them for, for damages. So that would make this a little bit more bearable. I'd be sad, but it's like, well, <laughs> uh, after legal fees, I'll I'll make a few bucks. So hooray for for that. I'm doing better than that this week. I've had a <laughs> a good week since last week. Got my my 
Gear VR, which we'll talk about later, but that's been a fun new toy to play with. I installed uh, the SSD in my laptop, put a, a fresh copy of Windows on it, just to wipe out like six years of history of me doing stupid shit to that thing and then fixing it and breaking it and fixing it and the viruses that it's had. Just a just fresh start. Should have done it a long time ago, but it's like a it's like a new machine with an SSD. I mean you don't really get much in the way of performance aside from faster boot times and, and programs loading a lot quicker. But that makes all the difference in yeah, the Yeah well uh, at least Windows, it tends to collect junk anyway. Yeah. Or I should say older versions of Windows. I haven't spent enough time with Windows 10 to know if it does that for certain or not. Mostly because Windows 10 is more of a mobile <laughs> operating system than anything else. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if it does it or not. I'm, I'm going to assume so because, you know, it is a Microsoft product and they love to collect junk. And, uh, well, obviously data on their users now, but still. Yeah. Um, but so yeah, I've got an SSD in my laptop and it feels real nice, real nice. I immediately put Factorio on it. It loads real quick. But that's, that's pretty much the extent of my week. I mean, I guess we had our, <laughs> our uh, housewarming on Saturday and that was fun. Spent a lot of time working on the, our house and now I'm just like, yeah, I need some time off. I'm not doing anything for a while. Oh, I had to mow my own lawn for the first time in years. It's terrible. Well, that's well, that's what neighbor kids are for, at least until yours is old enough. Yeah, there's no neighbor kids. We have the oldest kid in the cul-de-sac, and uh, he's three. So, most of our neighbors are retired old people. Well, look there's... at it this way: King is going to make so much money in about oh, five years. He will. He will. Mostly from mowing our lawn. <laughs> Although he has to do that for free because we're his parents. But yeah, we've got two retired couples, uh, an old cat, crazy cat lady, and then one younger couple that's about Katie and I's age. I think they're a couple of years older than us. Uh, and their kid is is still being uh, assembled by his mother's body. Oh, my. So that's, uh, yeah, King's the oldest, oldest kid in the neighborhood. And you're just saying they're thinking... You know, you could do some research to make this happen faster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if well, you increased least, your uh, resource well, gathering efficiency. Well, at least they're done with the inserters. <laughs> well, I mean, hopefully they're not done with the inserters. If they if they are, their marriage is kind of fucked. Because <laughs> there's not, or not. Any fucking <laughs> Uh, so shall we? Uh, shall I paste in the games uh, played? Since you, I'm sure you're curious. I am. Give me a second. I'm adjusting my chair. <laughs> yeah, you're just All saying right. that you're staring at uh, the games that we played the list in that empty spot that I have. Yep, with the the cursor, the the pink cursor. Oh, tomboys need love too. <laughs> Yay! Yes. I uh, after the discovery queue last week. I went through my press accounts and hunted this game down. <laughs> nice. I'm very excited to hear about this game. Uh, it's not a bad, uh, what well, budget level uh, visual novel. It's uh, I've played uh, through one story out of five, uh, and it took me uh, two hours and change. Uh, I would say probably closer to three, but that's also. Uh, sitting there and really reading the story, not uh, reading it casually, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, trying to pay more attention to it. It's an interesting take on uh, tomboys and, uh, well, really romance and visual novels in general in that uh, the female lead is uh, the assertive force in this. And uh, the uh, male lead, your character, is kind of a wimp. <laughs> I mean, Grant, they do some literary things that are a little annoying, like the info dump. Um, you know, uh, I look in the mirror and uh, I'm, uh, I see uh, an 18 year old uh, a high school senior looking back at me. It's like, don't do that. I mean, really? <laughs> Why is that so frustrating to you? Uh, it, it's a very, very cheap way to uh, talk about the character's appearance. And it's a fucking visual novel. You don't need to do that. 
Because, yeah, that's fair. They could because have... the well, the visual novel for one, it it's not uh, uh, one of those where the uh, main character is faceless, which there are some like that where you know you never see your character, you always uh, hear about them, but you never see them. Uh, it's uh, yeah, first person perspective essentially. But this isn't one of those, so you don't need to do that. <laughs> Does it go to speak to some other level of characterization, like? Um, there's a thing in, in, it's a, a therapy technique called the mirror, uh, technique where that you have someone like talk about themselves in a mirror and they tell you like what they see and then you tell them what they would see or what you see and compare the two. Or is it literally just like, yes, I'm an 18 year old yeah, boy. Yeah, literally the second one. Oh, uh, okay. Well, fuck. That's stupid. I mean, I mean, that is just the opening like 30 seconds and it's. Uh, one of those that could have been done a lot better with a better intro, but uh, I think the premise of uh, having a more sort of uh, female lead is uh, a lot more interesting. Uh, there's really, it's a very limited cast. Uh, I would say only really three main characters with a couple of secondary characters. Okay. Uh, and it, it, like I said, it's not a terrible thing. It's, uh, I wouldn't, uh, if I was uh, suggesting uh, opening visual novels, I would probably go still with more like if my heart had wings over this, uh, mostly because it's not much of a price difference to begin with. And it's also a better quality novel, but it's also a lot longer of a story. This is a very short story. And it also feels like, well, at least the main uh, 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 romance, I went with uh, the tomboy because, you know, tomboys need love too. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Roll and, credits. And it's one of those things that it feels a bit of a rushed uh, romance, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting together, but it's also uh, the childhood friend. And it's someone that this guy has known since he was a little kid. So, you know, there's that, there's not the, you know, meeting and getting to know on so, um, uh, someone in this novel because it's already there, but it also leads to a lot of really funny banter going back and forth between uh, him and the uh, main female. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, talk, uh, talking about embarrassing moments uh, growing up and, uh, you know, them picking on one another. Which I really liked, and it made it so that the friendship felt like it was as old as it was being depicted as, you know? Right. Because I, I would like to think that uh, someone that I've known for that long uh, especially, you know, just seeing him as one of the guys, you would be able to pick on him uh, back and forth like that. Right. Yeah, yeah, not uh, uh, with malice, just, you know, uh, just friendly uh, 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 toying with one another. Yeah, as you do with close friends or family yeah. or something like, I mean, I'm that way. I pick on people I like all the time. Yeah, so like, it's uh, that sort of uh, relationship between the two, and it does make it so that the... Uh, the accelerated romance between the two does feel like it can work. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's one of those that I wish it was more than uh, covers. Uh, I think it covered about five days uh, of uh, story time and a, about two and a half, three hours, which mm -hmm. isn't terrible, but it does feel a little rushed, particularly because of you know, the events that uh, go down. And uh, the other uh, female lead, uh, uh, well, it's a Ka uh, Kai, Chris, and Sophie, all right? And can you guess which one is the tomboy? <laughs> Probably Chris. Yes. Uh, uh, the other one, uh, Sophie, at least in uh, what's considered the good ending, and what I would consider the story that they would want you to read first, you know, uh, going for Chris... She feels very one-dimensional, but it also feels like there's something more there that would be unlocked if you played her story. And it's one of those things that I, uh, that they could have probably done her motivation a little bit better because she is kind of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Man-stealer, uh, antagonistic uh, to pretty much any relationship in her class. But also two faced, you know, make it so that she's uh, she plays the victim card, you know, right? And it's one of those things that I wish that there was more about her. 
at least in the main story or in the uh, story that I played, but I have a feeling that uh, it goes more into depth about why she's like this in her story. And I just didn't get to that. Art wise, it's not bad. It's pretty clean. It, it's not exceptionally high quality, but it's not low quality either. I've seen a lot worse in visual novels. And of course, because this is a budget uh, visual novel, it does have the adult patch. And, and this is a kind of an oddity with uh, the adult patch in that it doesn't add content. It just changes content. Okay. In, in that, that the adult patch is purely visual. So it just shows the, it exposes the breasts for our pleasure. Oh, not just the breasts. Oh, you get some dick too. Uh, I didn't see dick in this, but I did see the pussy. Ah, so the breasts and the vaginas were exposed yep. for our pleasure. Yeah, and it, there's, it was one of those that, it's actually a little bit of a shock because uh, some of the other budget, uh, budget visual novels I played that had the uh, adult content in them as a patch would, you know, just uh, cut the uh, sex scenes altogether. But in this, it's just, you know, uh, she's wearing a robe. But it, uh, with the patch in, oh, she's buck naked. Which I've seen that before in yeah. some visual novel. Yeah, games but yeah, but like yeah, but the budget ones on Steam. Uh, no, I don't think so. That's why it caught me a little off guard. And also, uh, there's one scene. Uh, well, whenever you really start to talk to Sophie, because the the storyline is well, at least the uh, the opening premise is that. Uh, Chris has a very, very obvious crush on Kai. Uh, and Kai is uh, oblivious to this because he's a male lead in a visual novel. Right. And he's also kind of a, a really a bland character. He almost feels like a self-insert character. You know, you're supposed to see yourself in that situation more than him. There's enough there that prevents me from saying that uh, that's uh, completely the case. And it may just be that he's a bland person. Yeah, yeah, you know, but at the same time, it's a little hard for me to tell one way or the other. And he has this major crush on the class president because, of course, she's the class president, uh, Sophie. And uh, there's rumors flying around about her that uh, she's a bitch, <laughs> and, and and the the presence that she gives in class is not her, you know, who she really is. It's a mask. Okay. And I don't want to give uh, too much away, but uh, one of the things with the adult patch, uh, in whenever you first meet her, is uh, that she's been attacked. I mean, this is within the first 30, uh, 30 45 minutes of the, uh, of the novel, depending on how quickly you read. Okay. And she's rather disheveled. And uh, with the adult patch, you, you see some things. I see. Uh, but it also makes sense. It's not just titillation. It also uh, uh, pl it makes the scene feel a lot more intense, which uh, it's not, it's one of those things that I could definitely see someone uh, getting excited by this. But at the same time, you know, at least at the time, before, this was before you really start to uh, you know, uh, uh, form your opinion on Sophie. It's more, you know, Kai's opinion. Uh, you feel bad for her. And you start to wonder if other things happened. Yeah. That makes sense. I'm glad and, they did that well, too. Instead yeah. of either just going for straight titillation with that, which mm -hmm. would be scummy, but I've definitely seen it done before. Or just, like, fucking it up and being like, well, why is this here? I mean, don't get me wrong. There's definitely uh, a couple scenes like that. Uh, but there's also... Uh, you know, the scenes uh, like with uh, Sophie's uh, uh, being beaten up is that, you know, it, the adult patch adds uh, things that make sense. Yeah. And, well, uh, the other thing that, uh, well, visual-wise, is that uh, the adult scene, well, r not just the adult scenes, but all the, uh, I guess, CG, uh, for in sarcasm quotes in this, because all of this is CG, I mean, let's be perfectly honest, all the Don Sprite based uh, scenes are static images. When a lot of uh, visual novels, whenever they have a uh, uh, a scene like that, 
they'll at least change the facial expressions or have more than one uh, image in that scene, you know? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. And for this, only the very, very last CG scene had a second slot, <laughs> and it was all static. Which, for some of them, it made sense, but for others, it didn't because they would talk about how they would move or, you know, uh, hug or something. And you would right. uh, still see the, uh, the old scene or, you know, or see something that hadn't happened yet in that scene. So it's one of those things that it's a little off. Right. Uh, That's probably down to the budget nature of it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and one other thing that I kind of liked uh, was uh, on the audio side of things. Uh, audio was, it's not bad, not terrible, uh, uh, but, you know, not amazingly great. But, it, you know, it had the music that uh, set the scene really well. But probably the moment that the uh, audio side of things really stood out for me. Well, first of all, there's no voice acting in this at all. It's a completely silent novel, which I'm not going to dock at points for because it is a budget game to begin with. But Yeah, sometimes I prefer it that way, too. Yeah, I, I think I prefer either fully voiced or non-voiced. I don't really care for the partially voiced unless they do it well. And the thing is that a lot of the budget games don't do it well. Yeah. But there's this a moment where he's trying to figure out uh, his feelings. This is also very early in the game. And you hear the happy, cheerful music, uh, uh, you know, essentially his theme. And he's uh, trying to figure out things. And he just has this moment where everything kind of clicks and the music stops. Just dead. And I thought that was a really good uh, way to use the music. Yeah, I agree. That is good. You know, just, uh, just the line where kind of the shoe drops, uh, he uh, uh, figures out something and just music's gone. And uh, it feels a little odd to say that my favorite time that they uh, for the music was when they weren't using it, but <laughs> there you no, go. I mean, it's, I mean, sound is is powerful, and sometimes yeah. it's about when you use it, um, and then sometimes it's about when you don't use it. Yeah, and particularly for uh, well, this was a a single developer who uh, licensed out uh, some music and some art, uh, or hired some uh, artists. But this is a single uh, develop, a person development team. Yeah. So I think the author of uh, the story uh, knew really well when to do uh, that drop. And he only I think that was the only time that he really did it. Other times there were silent scenes that were more intense. But it was just that one moment that really stood out to me audio-wise. But pretty good uh, uh, budget novel. Yeah, it sounds good. I mean, I I was already on board to buy it. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just reinforced my, yes, I should pick this up. Oh, and one thing, other thing I should say about the adult patch is that uh, they did do something that, in it that I liked, is that uh, if you install it, it's in the options to easily turn on and off. That's nice. Because usually it uh, the adult patches uh, either overwrite or just, you know, drop all the files in. Yeah. And it's very tough to remove. Which, you know, usually uh, it's not that big a uh, deal, but eh, in this, it, you know, it's uh, very nice. And it's also a fully featured novel in that it has a, a gallery. Granted, the gallery is just, you know, the uh, single scenes, you know, during usually the uh, scenes that you really want to go back and re look at. <laughs> yes, for scientific purposes. Research. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that they actually have one, because a lot of these budget novels tend to uh, just skip that feature or have very limited options to begin with. This had uh, full sound options. And uh, really, outside of content, it was pretty much the baseline of you know, your standard visual novel uh, for just feature-wise. Yeah. Which is sadly, you know, uh, not uh, the norm. Uh, so uh, I think that's uh, about all I have to, have to say about Tom Boy's Need Love 2. I ended up rambling about it for 20 minutes on uh, my channel, and I think I did about the same here. <laughs> uh, we're 24 minutes in. Yeah, I was going to say roughly 25, because I don't keep a timer. 
So, yeah, somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes. Good thing I buffed up the uh, the game's estimate. <laughs> All right. Okay, so, so uh, I did. Uh, that's not the only technically visual novel that I uh, played this week. Because I also did something on mobile, which is a rarity for me. But I uh, I saw this uh, suggested to me in Google Play. You know, just uh, opened up Google Play uh, every so often and saw this and thought, yeah, that looks interesting. Odin Cart, a heartwarming tale. Well, that's the full title of it. I just have Odin Cart in uh, the uh, show notes, which I'll update that. But this is, I would technically call this a visual novel. Uh, they uh, are, uh, well, a visual novel clicker, I guess, is the best way to put it, because you are the owner of an Odin cart. And you're essentially listening to the troubles of your uh, patrons and uh, you know, learning more about them. And that's really the story. And, uh, it's an interesting take on just how they're doing it because there's all the uh, they're well in the I want to say I played this for about 30 45 minutes and I've barely scratched the surface on the content was I encountered uh, I would say four or five different uh, people and as you talk to them you get uh, little tidbits like there's one girl who moved from a fishing village and she talks about uh, how uh, her landlord is giving her problems uh, because she's not used to living in the big city. Uh, there's a uh, middle-aged uh, uh, working woman who uh, just doesn't have time for her family anymore. That's, uh, and there's a, a guy that's about in the same situation. Oh, uh, and let's see, there is a retired old man that uh, just uh, is, uh, you know, your stereotypical grumpy old man. So he's you. <laughs> Uh, I'm not that old. <laughs> Plus, he doesn't have a cane. Ah, I see. Uh, but it's it's an interesting take on uh, the visual novel, uh, uh, visual novel clicker, which I haven't really seen a lot of, or haven't played a lot of. I guess I should say. I'm sure that there's plenty of them on uh, on uh, mobile. It's just something that caught my eye, just mostly because of the theme. And they right. do have uh, the monetization on it is <clears throat> that uh, I think that you could pay to restock your cart and you could uh, play for a certain amount of time. And as you uh, have uh, customers show up, uh, they'll uh, give you money uh, and you could restock your cart. And you could also determine who shows up by stocking certain Odin. And it does look like there is a sequel to it. And I just played the first one. And it looks like they changed the art style a fair amount as well. To a more exaggerated style. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. So I I downloaded the first one on my phone. Mm -hmm. This looks like a, a a neat little neat little game to try out. I've been looking for some new mobile games to play while I'm out on the road. Well, I'm obviously I, not while I, I'm driving. I, hesit I hesitate to call this a, a game because it's a, yeah, a clicker. Because uh, well, you can see on the screenshots, or at least uh, Jared can. That a lot of it is just clicking the uh, text bubbles that pop up, and as you get uh, do uh, text bubbles or do uh, sync uh, uh, things that you haven't heard before, that's when the next level of the story unlocks, and right. uh, the person has to show up several times before you start getting more and more story. I would say it's visual novel esque. That's why I was calling um, that visual novel clicker is that it has that clicker aspect to it. Yeah. And uh, because it does have it where you have to play a certain amount of time in order to get to make sure you have the money, unless, well, you just want to pay into it, which honestly I wouldn't. Mostly because I'm cheap. Yeah, I probably wouldn't either. But it's one of those things that, yeah, I, I, I like the visual novel uh, genre to begin with, when it, where it's done well. That's the problem is that uh, visual novels are very, very easy to make. There's a lot of tools out there to make them. And that makes it so that it's it has a low barrier to entry, so there's a lot of crap out there. Right. And also a lot of visual novels tend to rely on a gimmick, a gimmick and usually they're tits. <laughs> 
I mean, let's be perfectly honest. Uh, titillation and sex sell games. And sex sells just about anything. Unless you're trying to uh, sell fuckings, then, then you get in trouble. <laughs> Unless you're in certain places in the United States or uh, countries that have legal prostitution, like Australia. Or maybe it's New Zealand. Sure, I hope it's Australia, because literally everything's trying to fuck you up on that uh, uh, continent, so you may as well be able to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, there was a joke that I heard that uh, someone uh, wanted to check out a, a, a book on all the uh, dangerous animals in Australia, and they went into this room, and it was just shelves and shelves and shelves of books. And they said, okay, well, what about the uh, books on uh, the non-dangerous animals. So they were led to another room, and in the middle of the room there was this pedestal, and on it was a single sheet of, sheet of paper that said, some of the sheep. <laughs> Put out. And goodbye, Hacky. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Alright, so is that all you got to say on uh, Odin Cart? Uh, pretty much. Uh, it's one of those that I'm not sure if I would. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll play it all the way through, just because it is very grindy, particularly once you uh, get some of the opening story from your opening customers. But it's right. also interesting enough that it, I wanted to talk about it, and I would love to see a a more uh, business oriented uh, visual novel as well. I mean, I know that they're out there, and. Or I should say business management, because I, whenever I first got this, I was thinking that it was going to be more management and less clicker. But right. uh, I guess technically you could do some business management to try to tailor, uh, you know, who shows up. Because as you talk to people, you learn their favorites and they'd, you know, if you want someone to not show up because, you know, you've learned everything about them and you don't give a damn anymore, just stop stocking their favorite food and they stop showing up. It is one of those weird things uh, game wise where... You know, someone talks about being broke and they show up at an Odin cart, you know, five times a day. <laughs> that, uh, that's an addict's behavior pattern, though. They don't have yeah, the money because I spend it all on my addiction. <laughs> so really, what you're doing is you're staging an intervention by not having their favorite food. <laughs> and they don't come spend all their money. Okay. Well, let's go talk about your third game, then. All right, so ready for a Bethesda bitch fest? Oh yeah! Because I have a feeling we're both going to be ju jumping on this, but for me, it's Rage. And yes, this is going to get very, very confusing, I'm sure. But Rage is a, a FPS. Uh, it was developed by id Software and published by Bethesda. And oh dear God, this was a pain in the ass to even get running. I, I was wanting to uh, do a series on this for my YouTube channel, and I'll be perfectly honest, I still haven't figured out what I'm going to record in place of Halo. Because I'm over three on games I wanted to try out. <laughs> and Rage was one of them. And I, Rage was one of those that I wanted to try out, and I would probably end up playing. But the thing is that it is just a pain in the ass to even get running. Well, let's start off. I downloaded the game, you know, like you do. Because that's right. usually how things work these days. Tried to start it up, immediately crashes. All right, not a good start. But to be fair, this is a Bethesda published game, so, you know, it's about par for the course for Bethesda. Right. So, uh, loading up again, crashed again. You know, just to, you know, the scientific method. Um, I wanted to make sure I could repeat the result. And it was also giving me the option for a 64-bit uh, version of uh, the executable uh, for mods. But, yeah, I wanted to see, you know, is that any more stable? Answer, hell no. So then it's to the Googles. And I find out that it doesn't like AMD hardware. Well, this is going to turn out well. I start searching around and find out that it doesn't like certain versions of the Radeon software. Particularly uh, the last five, six versions I've been running. All right, fine. I'll try updating because I think I'm a version, maybe two versions behind the cutting edge uh, drivers. Just to play it safe and, you know, to be able to say that I at least tried to do that. Right. Because there's no way in fuck I'm going back six versions for this game. 
Now, mind you, Rage is, I think, a six or seven year old game at this point. Came out in 2011, so October of 2011, so almost six years. All right, close enough. So, update to the current uh, version of Drivers. Hey, it loads up. All right, well, let's try test recording. Um, why can't I tab out? Really, you disabled the fucking Windows keys as well? Oh, this is not going to end well. Fine, uh, close out the program, uh, load up DX Tour in the background, restart Rage again. By this point, I'm uh, yeah, starting to live up to its name. Or I'm starting to live up to my name with the Rage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, start recording. And it's one of those games that absolutely hates DX Tori. Well, fuck. Fine then. Close, uh, close Rage again. Close DX Tori. Load up OBS in the background. Uh, start up Rage again. All right. I can't tab out of Rage when it's in full screen. Uh, drop it down to windowed mode. Try to tab out. I still can't fucking tab out of this goddamn game. Uh, so, I'm making a sad face for you. Just so you know. So, fine. Maybe it's the window... Uh, yeah, uh, something in uh, the uh, code that they have it where it, that, where it drops the window boat. I know. Let's try borderless uh, oh, uh, uh, gaming window. Yeah, yeah the, the third person uh, software to make it so that window mode goes to a borderless full screen. Okay, well, get that running. And uh, Rage finally decides that, oh, oh, yeah, okay, fine, I'll do a forced borderless windowed. But you're going to get a 11 FPS. Fuck it. Precisely 11? Precisely 11. On the, uh, on the main menu. Okay. Precisely 11. I was using the uh, Steam overlay FPS checker. And it was one of those things that uh, there was enough animation on the uh, on the main menu to tell that yeah something was wrong with the FPS because everything was uh, suddenly running a lot slower and a lot jerkier. Despite what PC uh, uh, gamer thinks, yes, FPS is fucking important. Thought you said you weren't going to talk about that. Sorry, that article pissed me off enough that I need to at least uh, uh, make a passing shot at them. Bunch of fuckwits. Good word, fuckwit. Uh, but fine then. Uh, I try a few other things, and it still gives me 11 FPS, but at least, uh, and that's the only way that I could get it to actually tab out. Fuck it, uninstall. I never even start a new game. <laughs> I, I don't know what I was thinking, uh, downloading something from Bethesda, because Bethesda is, I would say, probably the second worst behind Ubisoft on just general usability of their software, at least on PC. And for me, the worst, because I usually stay the fuck away from Ubisoft stuff, unless it's a open beta, then why the hell not? Or if it's free. Yeah. So, I'm going to piggyback on this discussion of a Bethesda game, because one of the topics I wanted to bring up is kind of old news, because it started the week I was moving. So, Prey... I've talked about Prey a couple of times, a game that I'm interested in. I'll do Obviously, Prey Tell. hey -o. Obviously waiting for it to release, because thou shalt not pre-order. Uh, Unless you want a spanking. And see how it does. And not the so, sexy kind either. So Prey's demo when it released on console versions... <laughs> oh, sorry. At the, towards the end of April, uh, had, particularly on PlayStation had massive input lag issues. Like, we're talking like a second plus wow. between a button press to the action on screen. And it wasn't isolated incidents on PlayStation. It was pretty widespread. It was upwards of 50% of players were experiencing this issue. And then the Xbox also had this problem. But they were like, we'll fix it. We promise this will be fixed by release. Don't worry about it. Make sure you pre-order. It'll be fine. Game comes out uh, first week of May, still has this problem. Input lag issues like crazy on, again, particularly on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 4 Pros. 
Uh, but don't you know if then, you're playing on a console, you don't have to worry about uh, issues. It, the game runs perfectly every single time. And then it also had these issues on Xbox, less widespread than the PS4 problems. Uh, and then it was okay on PC unless you used a controller. So if you use keyboard and mouse, you're fine. If you use a controller, especially a PS4 controller, you experience input lag issues. Why would you use a controller on PC? Uh, for a first-person shooter or... Yeah, oh, for a first, first, first per, yeah, for a per, first person shooter. As a matter of fact, I was, I did see a couple of reviews, and there were people talking about how it was tough to aim, and they were doing reviews on the console versions. It's like, of course, it's tough to aim. Yeah, but the there, there's there's can... there's little. Uh, uh, well, I don't want to use the term head crab like because they're they don't look like head crabs, but you know, a head crab sized alien darting heads. around. It's like, of course you're going to have trouble aiming. Yeah. But, so anyway, so it, it has problems on PC as well if you use a controller. Plus, the PC had its own smattering of issues that, as far as I know, are have not been fixed. Supposedly, they've got the controller issue fixed uh, in a patch that was released over the weekend. So, I was listening to Polygon's Quality Control talking about this game, and I got my weeks mixed up. I thought that it was from this past week, but it was from the week before. Uh, so uh, the, a lot of the issues they were talking about have been fixed, but just like Bethesda, I I stuck up for you guys for a long time, gave you the benefit of the doubt, but now I'm firmly in rage, Rage's camp. Fuck them. Fuck them. I'm not even excited for the next Elder Scrolls game, and that really makes me sad. I'm dubious I like to be about the next Elder Scrolls game particularly with the route that they've taken with the Elder Scrolls game uh, they would have to do a major turnaround yeah I mean I, I I hate saying that I absolutely despise playing Skyrim but there was just so many little things that took me out of that game and yeah I beat the main story and I didn't realize I beat the main story until I got the achievement it's like, really? That's the final boss fight? That That's the world-ending fucking dragon? Oh, yeah. Real scary. I mean, it, there was a, a blood dragon that I fought just before it that was a hell of a lot tougher. Yeah. So, I, I skipped over this because I forgot until just now, but Prey's main issue on PC is uh, if you turn V-Seek on, V-Seek? V-Sync on. v -seek. It it's, locks the it's game. French. It locks the game at twenty four frames a second. It's cinematic. There were many jokes made about that, <laughs> and it, I mean, it doesn't matter what your monitor's refresh rate is or what the frame rate of the game is. Doesn't matter. You flip on V Sync, twenty four frames a second. I'm so. trying to decide how the hell they got twenty four. I mean, no I, I, I mean, obviously, obviously, I know, I know. Twenty four is literally the cinematic F F FPS for movies. It is, but usually, whenever they limit frame rates, it's usually either thirty or sixty. So yeah. how the how do they get twenty four? I mean, you can't even say that they're uh, tying it to physics because that would likely be thirty. Yeah, and it was easily. Like, I mean, it was happening across multiple hardware configurations. Like, I saw several Reddit posts about it. People, like, with awesome machines, with crappy machines. Didn't matter. 24 frames a second. And the patch has not fixed that issue for a lot of people. So whatever they did wasn't That's successful. That's just mind-boggling. I mean, 24. <laughs> yep. And the PC also has 24. Yeah, 24. 24. All right. 24. 24. The following events take place between 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. Get it? 24? Yeah. In the next hour, you get one frame. <laughs> it is a budget visual novel. It's super hardcore budget. So, yeah, I just I wanted to bitch about Prey. And I, I very rarely look forward to anything that even comes close to a horror, horror title. But Prey actually looked pretty interesting. I liked a lot of the elements that they threw into the game, the RPG stuff. Um, even though it really is not connected to the original Prey at all, well, uh, I... aside from being called Prey. I liked the first Prey, so I was like, okay, if they do a lot of the same things, I'm cool with that. 
But well, Craig Crowbar was uh, talking about Prey on one of their last episodes. I'll be perfectly honest. I usually download a podcast once every couple of weeks and uh, mass listen to them. So it's been within the last few weeks. Obviously, I mean, they can't go back that far and be talking about Prey because, you know, they didn't have pre-release copies because nobody got pre-release copies because fuck Bethesda. Some people uh, that, got pre-release copies. Yeah, a day before it launched. That's not enough to review the damn thing. Or you know, No, even... someone had a, a pre-release copy the week before because they oh, can break their own rules. Oh, yeah, that's probably a streamer uh, that was uh, paid to do that. I mean, I hate being uh, you know, <laughs> that cynical, but yeah, you know, that's literally what they said was that you know streamers uh, will get the uh, release copies before uh, reviewers because fuck you, be sure to pre-order. Yeah, but they were talking about how uh, the game, if you uh, play it like a horror game, you could eventually just break it because you'll uh, take your time and you start building up more and more stuff. To the point where your resources aren't limited anymore. And because they had it where you could approach things from different angles. Uh, you're occasionally taking something uh, from an angle that the game wasn't expecting you to. And just completely brick an encounter. Or even skip an encounter. Yeah. Which, in some ways, I kind of like, you know, it being more open world and having it where you could... Uh, do things that the game uh, uh, that yeah makes it so that you're not fighting a particular boss. I'm I'm not sure if these are boss fights or what. They didn't go uh, to specifics because they didn't want to spoil the story because yeah you know, it is a very new game still. But I do kind of like that idea, but the game has to be built around that idea. And Prey does doesn't sound like it's uh, built that way. And also the well, fact that it's a horror game where you are you can be swimming in resources. Yeah. And Prey, Prey uh, does not... I mean, things are gated off, but there's no specific way you have to go through. Like, if you get the skills or abilities or collect the equipment you need to open sort of the next place to go, you can just do that without completing the area you're in. And there's no set order you have to go through them in. So, yeah, and well, they were also talking about that, and uh, the, it sounds almost like it was done as an afterthought, particularly because of the way that the journal's done, uh, at least according to Cree and Crowbar. In that, okay, if uh, you're doing a quest or you have a quest and you happen to find something that's, let's say, six or seven steps down the line, you know, let, let's say you're being sent to go get a MacGuffin. And you're told to go to this spot, but the MacGuffin's not there. So you're uh, so you're told, okay, well, check over here, or over here, or over here. Well, let's say, just by happenstance, you uh, get the quest, and then, uh, while you're just wandering around, you find it. Instead of saying, well, I found uh, this in this spot, it fills in all the previous journal entries, saying that you went to somewhere that you didn't go to, and then find it there. Which is just terrible. Yeah, it's that's lazy. Stupid. Yeah, it's real dumb. Grant, this is not something that I could uh, confirm for, uh, firsthand, but eh, it's one of those things. Yeah, uh, that uh, yeah, you know, just listening to uh, uh, to, uh, to actual gaming journalists or gaming uh, professional uh, writers for uh, games talk about yeah some of the things that just feel off about the game really sticks out to me. Yeah. And it's one of those games that uh, I, I'm not sure if I would pr uh, play Prey. Well, that's actually tough to say as well. <laughs> Prey, play, play, Prey. Prey, play, play, play. But it is something that would... Uh, maybe pick up on a sale if they fix the fucking thing. That's the thing. Yeah. So I'm looking at the most recent patch for it on Steam and one of the fixes players should no longer spawn outside of level. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. Yep. 
Also, they added an FOV slider. <sighs> Let's move on. I, I'm not sure if you could uh, hear this in the audio, but I'm face palming right now. I can imagine. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, new rule for Bethesda games. All right, I'm not going to make this a commandment, but any Bethesda game, whenever you go to the store page, mentally put in the early access tag until proven otherwise. Fair enough. Because honestly, these things, these are things I would expect in a fucking early access game, not a triple A release. It's like, yeah. Patch three, we added the FOV slider, guys. Okay. Just words fail me at just how stupid that is. It's about that stupid. All right, let's go talk about your last game slash my first game. Yeah, and I have a feeling that I may need to play some more of this because uh, it was my, oh, I'm fucking pissed off. I need to go kill something. And also, uh, well, this was also what we uh, streamed on Friday, so I needed to play a couple rounds just to uh, get warmed up and actually get our uh, clan up and running again, which makes it sound a lot more uh, dubious than what it really is. Warframe! <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Warframe. We haven't played this in a long time. Yeah, to the point that our clan in it is Kerbalcast MP. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we used to play Warframe like crazy, uh, end of 2015. Yeah, and early I think it's, 2016. It, either at some point they've rebalanced it, or well, I'm pretty sure they've rebalanced it, or just uh, put in a lot tougher enemies because it is a lot tougher than it used to be. Well, there have been two or three major update slash expansions to the game since yeah. the last time we played, so there's a lot of stuff that's different. The new yeah, map they, system is real dumb. Well, I think the my main problem with the map system is that there's a lot of times that you can't see what the hell you're doing. Because, yeah. well, uh, is it so much to ask that they stroke their fucking text? Which, that sounds a lot dirtier than what I mean. <laughs> no, it. I mean, they should, because it's like, but, I uh, accidentally, it, they're, they're, like... <laughs> There's orange text on orange background. Yeah. Or, you know, a similar color text on a background. It just is terrible. Yeah. I was I had to do a couple of single player missions in order to unlock something so we could keep playing because Well, I uh, well we didn't have to uh, do that. It was more, you know, uh, able to get better rewards. Right. But I accidentally did the wrong mission because it was like it didn't highlight properly the mission that I was supposed to do. So I thought I was doing the right mission. It's like, oh, wait, I need to do this mission. So, I mean, I just quit and went and did the proper mission. But other yeah, missions, like, this wait, is, this isn't called whatever. Yeah, this is the, uh, I think, the third major redo on their map system. Yeah. And honestly, I preferred their second one. Yeah, I, I never too. played the first one. I did. It was pretty shitty as well. Well, I think the major problem with this is that they rely a lot on icons, and they yeah. never tell you what the icons mean. The pro the biggest problem I have with this map is that there's just too much shit on it. Yeah, they uh, they they go the uh, AAA developer route where they make it shiny and less uh, user friendly. Yeah, yeah, it's it's I'd say on par with the first map that existed in Warframe. Um, the first map was really clunky and hard to use just from like a, um, an actual user interface perspective. But it was at least much easier to parse the data and figure out what was going on because there was just less stuff at that time. And this version of the map is, it at least works. I mean, the interface works, but there's just so much shit everywhere. You can't figure out what it is that you want to go to. And I mean, I'm sure that after a little while, you'd pick it up and be like, okay, this is how this works. But I mean, the the map that they had previous wasn't like that at all. It was super simple to figure out what was going on. They had just the right amount of icons, and... Well, this one, they also have it where things are gated off a lot more. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, we could kind of get around that to the, some degree, just because we had stuff uh, legacy unlocked. Yeah. But, uh, well, I should, we should probably go into exactly what the map system is. Uh, you play as a Tenno, a... Uh, 
Space Ninja. Let's be yes, perfectly honest. I was going to say Space Ninja. Well, what well, the, well, their tagline is to just play for, th- for play for free. So yeah. you're a, a robotic space ninja uh, killing everything. That's pretty much the story. I mean, yes, there is more story, but it's gated off and it's very late in the gameplay. It, it's it's a, one of those games that there's a a lot of backstory there if you go digging for it, but it's also one of those games that you could just go ha- start hacking sl- uh, and slashing away and not really care about the story for the most part. Granted, they do uh, block some features behind story quests. So, yeah. you know, eventually you will want to do them, but, you know, you probably won't care. But uh, you are an interplanetary space ninja, and you cover pretty much the entire soul system. Including some planets that are not planets anymore. Sorry, Pluto. Yep. And yep. dwarf planets and uh, and moons, of course. Not just ours. But uh, in between the planets are these junctions, which are, serve as links between the different planets. In order to unlock them, you have to essentially get certain achievements. And some of them are just ridiculous. Like one of the Uranus ones, Paul's for Chuckle, Tee-hee. Is you have to complete five missions in Uranus Tee-hee. with a melee weapon only. Oh, that's easy for me. Oh. Uh, but it's stupid. It is stupid, but I mean, they have to arbitrarily gate it somehow. Oh, and uh, but here's the thing here's the thing is that. It's not just, you know, you just use your melee weapon and, you know, you get credit for it. You have to unequip your other two weapons. Oh, because you have a primary, dumb. You have a primary and secondary weapon. And then you have a melee weapon. So you, it's the three weapon system. That's real dumb. It tracks which weapons you're using. Yeah. Actively in, in, on the maps. That's stupid. Yeah. Thankfully, you don't have to do five separate missions. You could just do the easiest ones over and over again. But still... It's, uh, yeah, stupid. And there's other things that are, are gated off that are annoyances at uh, best. Like, there's one where you have to uh, find segments of uh, for this one particular faction. And in order to do that, you have to rank up with that faction a little bit. This is w- one of the neutral factions. Or the neutral faction, I should say. And you have to rank up a bit to be able to uh, get essentially a camera. I mean, let's be perfectly honest, it's a camera. And uh, scattered throughout the levels, uh, uh, every so often you'll find a, a glowing segment, and you have to take a picture of it to unlock lore. Well, some of the junctions require you to find so many segments in that system, or on that planetary uh, uh, map. And it's one of those that you're not guaranteed to actually find these fucking things to begin with, and then you have to ha- make sure that you have that camera equipped and have enough charges on it. Because it's a consumable, of course. Of course. And uh, I'm, we're sounding really down on this. I, I really like the game. And it's one of those games that you know, I'll load up and just uh, start hacking and slashing away on it. Because it is a, a huge grind. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, content trade mill, essentially. Yeah. But it's uh, catharsis, catharsis, you know? Yeah. I mean, I really like Warframe, too. I mean, we're kind of bitching about these changes, but overall, the game is still the great game to play that it was. I mean, there's been some obvious balancing changes to certain things, and they've added new content and stuff to just keep the the gear treadmill going. But, I mean, overall, it's a fun game to play. If you've ever heard us talk about it before, I mean, anything that we've ever said still applies. Yeah, one thing that they did that was interesting is that they changed how you get prom stuff. And, uh, well, prom stuff is essentially a, a Mark II version of uh, weapons or warframes. Uh, usually more powerful, uh, just generally. But this is also u- mostly a uh, player versus environment game. There is some PvP in the game, but it's a very, very small segment of the population. Yeah. But uh, in order to get the the prom stuff now, it used to be that you had to get void keys, and those void keys unlock particular missions. Uh, one of, I think there's five different types. There's interception, there's sabotage, there's a defense, mobile defense, and exterminate. 
uh, and capture. I didn't say capture, so six uh, types. But capture is a rarity in the void. Or at least it used to be, I think. Uh, I may be mistaken there. But anyway, or maybe it's interesting. Uh, I'm getting off track, which is hardly new for us. Yeah. Uh, and each of these missions had one of four tiers. And each of the tiers and each of the different mission types had a different loot table. And they also rotated, if they're an endless mission, the interception, defense, uh, survival, and that sort of thing, where it goes uh, every five minutes or every five waves, depending on the mission type, you got something out of the loot table. And it would go A, A, B, C, where uh, the A stuff would be your lowest tier stuff out of that uh, loot table. Then you'd have a B uh, a section of the loot table where it would choose something there and then a C. Well, usually you would get two A's, a B, and a C because usually people didn't want to stick around for more than 20 minutes or more than 20 waves. And because of that, it, you were usually very limited on what you got for each key. And it also made it so that people would do what they call key sharing, where for the missions that are a lot quicker, you would have uh, four people go in, which is the maximum, I think, of the uh, parties. And only the person that initiated the mission would use their key. Well, this also led to some people cheesing the system, you know, saying, oh, I'll go last and then, you know, just drop off whenever it's their turn to use their key, and, you know, getting free stuff. Right. Well, the new system is that they converted all the keys into these relics. And there's a lot of types of relics now. And each relic has one of four types, and the four types are the different uh, tiers, essentially, uh, that used to be in the game as keys. And I can't aim them offhand because I forgot them, and it doesn't really matter all that much. We'll just call them tiers one uh, through four. Sounds and, good. And each tier could have, I think, ten different types of relics. But it also allows you to tailor what you want. So let's say you want something out of this particular type of relic that's this tier. You could take that on any of the Fisher missions that are available. And the Fisher missions pop up randomly. And there are different types of missions. So it's just the typical mission of that level tier. But it's added enemies with uh, these Fisher of relics that you use to crack open the fissures or seal the fissures and crack open the relic to get the stuff. And also at the end of the mission, it has it where you're able to choose. So let's say me and Jared both went on their mission. We both took two, uh, we each took a relic of uh, different types. Let's say I got unlucky and I got something I already had on my relic, but Jared got something that I would like out of his relic. I could get a copy of what Jared got. He would still get what he got, or he could choose for what I got, which we actually had this happen where we did, Jared liked yeah. what I got and I liked what he got. So we swapped essentially, which sounds a lot sexier than what it really was. <laughs> yeah. But it opens up a lot of uh, possibilities of not being tied to a particular type of mission. I mean, yes, you are still tied to certain mission types. If the, uh, fishers opened up in types of missions that you don't want. But, you know, it's just one of those things that, okay, well, I could go do something else for a, cu uh, a couple of hours or just come back later and try again. Because the fishers only stay open for, I think, an hour, two hours tops. Yeah, most of them are about an hour, I think. Well, usually you're not catching them whenever they're originally opening as well. Yeah, I guess, and their times could vary, but the one or two that started while we were actually playing were an hour. So it's just uh, one of those uh, little changes that, well, I shouldn't say little. I mean, it is a pretty substantial change, but that is a good quality of life change, is that you know, you're not tied down to, okay, I have to do a tier two defensive mission in the void in order to get this uh, drop. And the drop is on the C rotation, so I have to do 20 waves in this uh, uh, defensive mission. No more of that. Granted, getting some of the relics can be a pain in the ass because they're usually in the endless mission, so uh, you're just doing the normal missions to grind out the relics. And you can get it where you get a lot of relics that you don't need. But I think the relics are tradable, so you can trade them back and forth. 
I actually didn't check that. Uh, I just I, where I played before and had a ton of keys, I got a lot of relics. Yeah, I've got a shitload of relics too. But this is also, a, this is a tread though, essentially. This is one of those games that you've had a rough day. You, uh, you had your medical drama extend by at least another couple of weeks at best. You just want to go fuck shit up. So you go get your biggest fucking sword that looks like it's out of Final Fantasy and you just start wrecking shit. Yep. Get fun. We'll, we should be playing some more of it too, I think. I mean... We don't have a yeah. reason not to. Yeah, just make sure that you've got all your quests done that you need to to do. Granted, I don't think you realized that you had to do that. I did. Yeah, I didn't know I needed to do that. That's why I suggested that we uh, play some t uh, together outside the stream. Indeed. Indeed, you did. Okay. So, do you have anything else to add to Warframe? I do not. I do not. So with that, let me move on to my other two games this week. So, Key Mailer was very generous to me this week. I received four games. Wow. Uh, I only got to play two of them. And one of those four games is um, an Xbox One title. So I haven't even, I haven't even touched that. I'm uh, uh, do you have an Xbox One? I do. Okay, I, I, I knew you had a 360. I couldn't remember if you had the one, though. Yep. Yep. Or at least what uh, yeah, Microsoft wants people to call it. The one. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, the the Xbox One game I got is called Trulon the Shadow Engine. Obviously, I haven't played it, so I'll be talking about that this week, but it, uh, it looks all right. Uh, but anyways, the two games that I played this week from Key Mailer, the first is called Cooking Witch. So Cooking Witch is basically a Newgrounds game. I mean, I've never <laughs> seen it on Newgrounds, but I started playing it, and I was like, this is like a Newgrounds game, where the point of the game is that you're a witch, and you control the witch, and you go pick up these kids from some kind of festival or something, and you drop them in your cooking pot, uh, and then eat their the flesh off of their bones. And you get power-ups from eating the flesh, and sometimes stars drop, and stars give you, like, they're like upgrade points. Uh, and you can upgrade your witch's broom to make it faster, and so that you can pick up more kids, uh, and you can... Upgrade yeah, your I, yeah, strength. I got a copy of this as well, and I uh, let, there's a reason why I went to one of my press accounts to get uh, Tomboy's Need Love too. <laughs> yeah, I played this game for maybe 15 minutes, and it's like that's all. And this I, is and all I there thought True on the Shadow Engine sounded familiar. I, I got this ages ago. Yeah, it's not like a, a brand new release game. I, yeah, I, I was just making sure, making sure that it wasn't a you know, a, you know, either a game that I just happened to see before or. Or, you know, just uh, sounded like another game. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so Cook I mean, Cooking Witch really does feel like a Newgrounds game. It's only like two or three bucks if you want to buy it on Steam, but really it's not even worth two or three bucks. Like, I might pay like 50 cents for this game. Well, wow, that's damning from you. Because yeah. Because your standards are a lot lower. There's just nothing there. After 15 minutes, I was like, okay, I've seen everything there is to see in this game. Literally nothing else is going to change. Like, there's no different settings or backdrops or anything. It's literally How about just same. go to Congregate? If it's on Congregate, go play it there, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it is, but, you know, uh, from everything that I saw, granted, I, I don't think I played it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know I didn't play it, uh, but uh, Adler may have gotten the keys off or gotten the uh, cards off of it. I mean, the game is not bad. It it feels like a student project or like a first game out of game design school, and this person is trying to sell it to make some money. And I mean, you know, more power to them. We you know we live in a a place that is very much yeah, but uh, here's loves the capitalism. Thing is that this capitalism is not the, this is not the uh, uh, this is not the first uh, game from the studio. Oh, it's not. You, well, you didn't look at this. No, I was like, all right. This well, is let's everything see. To see here. Uh, Plantria is essentially a gardening clicker game on Steam, also from this guy. Cooking Witch Loot Hero DX, which is essentially a clicker of mixed uh, uh, reviews. A Tap Heroes. Care to guess oh, what this is? Tap Heroes. No, I, I Tap Heroes is all right. It's a, a um, an idle game. 
I, I have Tap Heroes. It's okay. It's not the best one of those games I've ever played, but it's not the worst. So this is not their first game. Hmm. Well, it certainly feels like someone's first game. I mean, and, and literally, there's nothing else to say about it. I mean, if you really want to check it out, wait until you can find it for like 50 cents or find it free somewhere Well, right online. now it's a buck 50. Yeah, it's not worth a buck 50. I mean, I'm glad I got this game for free instead of spending money on it. It's just... It's like, oh, neat, for five minutes. Then it's like, okay, I, I'm done. I hate, I hate saying that, you know, uh, it's a Flash game, so, you know, you shouldn't be paying for it. But uh, because, you know, people use that uh, logic with Binding of Isaac because it really was a game built in Flash. But this... I've seen this game before. <laughs> Not this particular game, but yeah. pretty much this game. I mean, that's why I said this feels like something that it would have existed on Newgrounds four or five years, actually longer ago than that. Ten years. Ten years ago. Like, ooh, look at this edgy game where you're a witch and you cook kids and eat them. Yeah, but and of course like, the witch would uh -huh. be naked. Yeah. That would make this game better if the witch was naked, but she's not. And as or, far as I know, or, there's no or, adult or, patch. Or, sorry, uh, the the witch would be in a, in a burkini, uh, and the login version would have uh, duty. Yeah. So, I mean, there's just, there's just nothing to see here. Nothing really to talk about. Uh, the other that game that are. I played this week was Rocket Wars. Rocket Wars is pretty fun, actually. It's a simple um, top-down twin-stick shooter uh, with up to four-player multiplayer. This game has not released yet, so it's going to have an online component, and I really hope that there are some people there, but I think this is going to be one of those games that suffers like um, an indie game that nobody plays, so there won't be an online community. Yeah, this doesn't release for a few weeks, actually. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I think this is, it looks like it's going to be mostly local co-op, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. And this game uh, is real fact, simple. Uh, well, 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 here's the thing, is that their uh, opening blurb, their fast-paced local multiplayer game. So, yeah, that pretty much games any sales for them. Yeah. But, uh, but it's real simple, but it's real fun. It kind of falls into the, what was the game that I played last week? Um, I'm drawing a blank on the name. The, the, racing, oh, the racing ship. Yeah. Uh, Smash P Pixel Racing. This is fun in that way. Like, it's really simple. It's really easy. It's bright. It's colorful. Um, it's got lots of pew-pew noises. Um, and there's... I think there's 16 different ships that you can unlock. And they all... The, all of these ships do behave differently. They have different stats. Uh, but everyone has the same gun to start with. And there's pickups on the level. And different pickups and power-ups do different things and you can choose to like shield yourself or use your power-up as a you know the actual power-up that it is instead of using it for a shield and you can speed around and dodge and you can like do little tricks to like sort of rubber band off the edge of the map and there's this like star in the middle and if you fly into the star you blow up and it says sarcastic things like you win a darwin award or something like that <laughs> i mean it, it does say that and when i say something like that i mean something along those lines uh, as additional things to make fun of you. It's just a cute, quirky little game that's that's really well put together. Yeah, I so. think they're going to really suffer on sales. Uh, uh, I'm not seeing anything about online multiplayer on this, though. I could have swore I saw something that said it was uh, online well, multiplayer. Well, granted, I'm just going by what they have on the Steam Store page because I did not sign up for this because, well... The moment I see local multiplayer, I usually just click off of a game because it's usually that's it. Local multiplayer for especially these smaller games. And I'm I'm seeing local multiplayer, local co-op, shared split screen, and that's it on the tags. I might be mixing it up with something else. I could I don't see anything about it having online multiplayer on their page on Keymailer either. But I could have swore I saw that it was online. But, I mean, it could be another game I'm mixing it up with. Regardless, it's still a lot of fun. I really hope that, that there are groups of people who are get this game and play it together. And it does look it. like a pretty good uh, party game. It, assuming that it's easy enough to pick up. Because that's really the defining thing about a party game. is If it's easy enough to pick up. that uh, If you could explain to someone how to play it uh, well enough within a minute or two. It, it is. It is. Um, it took me two matches 
to be like, okay, this is exactly how you play this game. And then I actually started to perform uh, competitively with the, the AI that I had set up in the game with me. So, it, I mean, it only took me two games to figure out exactly what I was doing. And then when I first played it, I didn't even have a controller. So I had to do it with the keyboard. And it's way better with a controller, but it is playable, playable with the keyboard only. Um, and yeah, learning it on the keyboard within two matches. And, and matches are uh, the, the standard uh, free-for-all mode is first to ten kills. So they last three, four minutes. So yeah, it looks with, like it within, has a few different modes. Free-for-all, Survivor, Nuke King sounds interesting. Yeah, the the Nuke King mode is um, <clears throat> you're building up, like every kill you get builds up your like nuclear energy bar or whatever, and the first person to, to get enough kills to get the nuke instantly wins. So pretty much the same as, uh, uh, you know, first to so many kills. Yeah, but if you die, for example, by, like, crashing into a star or whatever, you lose points. Ah, all right. So it goes, it can go farther than, like, the first person to get 10 kills. And there are a lot of suicides. <laughs> a lot of suicides. It's real easy to crash into that star in the middle of the map and get yourself killed. Yeah. But, I mean, that I, makes I'm it just, fun. I, I am wondering what their price point is going to be on this, because there's no price... Uh... Uh, listed here, of course, because it's still before release. Yeah, as a fun single-player distraction, it's worth a couple of bucks, I think. If you've got a group of, of friends that, you know, you get together with and play games locally and want to add this to something that you guys play... I see this as being either a land game, maybe. Yeah, as a little bit of a distraction as someone uh, downloads something uh, more substantial. Which I hate saying that, because, yeah, there are small games there, you know, really deserve a lot more attention. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I don't think this would be one of them to get long-term attention from a group. But, you know, something that is a small distraction, <clears throat> this would uh, really pay off. But uh, either being a LAN or just, yeah, party game, which that's what they call it exactly as a party game. Yeah, and I think I think this game is easily worth five bucks if you've got friends that, you know, you can regularly play it with. Ten bucks is kind of iffy. Um... But I could still see some people liking this well enough to pay ten bucks for it. Anything over that, I don't think it's worth it. So I'm I'm hoping it does release in the five to ten dollar range as a new title, because I think this game has some potential as a pretty good indie party game. Uh, but you know, if they overprice it, then nobody's gonna buy it. Yeah, and that's the danger of releasing just local multiplayer only is that you are substantially cutting down the number of people that are gonna buy this game. Uh, not just the the idea that yeah only one person needs to buy in the group, uh, but also uh, friends are a lot more often nowadays uh, spread out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if it was uh, if you could buy like a a four person party pack or whatever, like some of these games get sold as, and it had online multiplayer. Actually, I think Valve has uh, stopped doing that in general. Oh, that sucks. But I would buy like a four you know a four copy you get four copies of the game for like 15 bucks and give it to three of you guys and then we could play it because i mean it would be fun for 20 30 minute sessions like somebody's tired they want to play games for like 20 or 30 minutes oh let's play this and they go to bed yeah i think my problem is if i'm tired and i want to play games for 20 or 30 minutes i either have to do what i'm playing ahead of time or i'm going to spend that time trying to figure out what i want to play yeah that's i mean that's what i'm saying like we would have this in our library and it's like oh let's play um, Rocket, whatever. Rocket Wars. How about we play uh, Robot Roller Derby Disco Dodgeball instead? <laughs> we could do that too. But uh, so yeah, those are the games that I played this week that are not on VR. I'm kind of lumping all those together for the next discussion. But uh, before we get to that discussion, I think it's time to take our first break. I've drank all of my coffee. And now you need to go relieve yourself of it. I do. So we'll be right back. All right. <clears throat> you ready to talk about some VR stuff? If we must. We must. Okay. Well, uh, our first topic... 
is sort of also still connected to games we played, but I wanted to kind of separate it from that. Uh, I got my Samsung. A? What? A. Hey. It's like a Fonzie to the games we played. But, anyways, I got my Samsung Gear VR on Friday, uh, and I have been messing with it all weekend. Uh, so I asked you to come up with some questions to kind of help guide me. Yeah, just I do I have like. A, yeah, I do have a few questions. It's <clears throat> more, I'm just going to let you chatter away and then uh, jump in every so often. <clears throat> okay. Well, I was going to say let's start with the questions and see where I go well, from there. Oh, okay. Well. Uh, my big question is: Does it any does it add anything to the experience of uh, the well VR and just in general, or um, does it feel like you're just staring at your cell phone about two inches away from your face? Yes and no. Um, so uh, something that I keep thinking as I'm doing this is like, you know, a lot of this stuff is pretty neat, but I can tell that I'm doing this on a phone. I mean the. Galaxy S8 Plus is, you know, one of the the most powerful phones on the market. Like, it just came out, you know, but yada, it's yada, still blah, blah, a blah, phone. Blah. But it's still a phone, and you can tell um, the certain uh, applications and things that you're doing. You can see the individual pixels because the pencil di pixel density isn't high enough when you're viewing it that close. Um, and... Someone like me, like Katie doesn't notice. Like we each got one because part of the promotion when we bought our phones, like the week that it came out, you know, you could, uh, you got a free uh, Gear VR headset. So we both have one. And Katie's been using it too. Uh, and she doesn't notice any of this stuff because I asked her about it and she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. But someone like me, I'm like, yeah, I can see the pixels there. I can see that. And because it's my phone screen, it's got dirt and dust and stuff on it that would wouldn't be in an. At least you headset. hope that's dirt. <laughs> yeah, at least I hope it's dirt. And I can see some of that too. So, depending on like what the application actually looks like, sometimes you can see those things, and it kind of really pulls you out. And it's like this is not great, but in some ways, it makes certain things amazing, like porn. <clears throat> do what? Uh, you're going to say porn, aren't you? No, porn's VR porn's weird. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the things that it makes amazing are uh, your workspace. So the Gear VR has got sort of this, I don't know, I guess you could call it like a home menu or something. But it's just this environment where all of the things are floating around you. And you have basically infinite desktop space. And the way that you can organize it and do stuff with it uh, to increase its efficiency and things... I'm trying to figure out how to hook some other things in to actually do some some real world work inside the VR environment. Because just being able to look around and be like, okay, here's this thing that I use and this thing that I use and they're all displayed and I can jump back and forth. And I know you're thinking like, well, yeah, I can do that with a monitor or multiple monitors, but it's not the same. And it's real. I've been trying to figure out how to explain this. It's just like, there's no alt tabbing. There's no <clears throat> dragging things around in different monitors. It's just like all floating in front of your face, and you can use the little controller that comes with it as basically like a, a mouse pointer and drag stuff around. And basically, and it's uh, it's like having all the monitors. And yeah, it's like having all the monitors in the world right in front of your face. So as a work, it's like having that room uh, <clears throat> in the last Matrix movie with the architect. Yeah. Only instead of it being a million tiny TVs, it's one giant wraparound screen. And a lot less Keanu Reeves. I wouldn't mind if there was more Keanu Reeves in my VR experience. <laughs> At least with that attitude, uh, you don't have it. But, but so I really like that, and I want to use utilize it to, to do some more work with, because it, in some ways, can streamline some of the things that I do. Uh, and anything to make paperwork more interesting gets my vote in the positive. Um, so that's something that it adds that I honestly wasn't expecting. And then the thing that I was kind of looking forward to, because I've heard like Total Biscuit and other people say this, is uh, using it to watch movies and things on. Um, it, it's the closest thing that you can get to a theater experience without sitting in a theater. You put on your nice headset um, so that you get really yeah, good but surround you have sound. Yeah, VR instead. Sorry. <laughs> I, but, I realize Gear VR is like the second tier of VR uh, from everything I've heard. It's just above uh, Google Cardboard, but it's below <clears> the big boy uh, headset still. 
I think it's third tier because Oculus and um, Vive are are top tier, and then the PSVR is second tier. Yeah, I've heard and a lot of people this. go in between. It really depends on uh, I think uh, just how picky the person is. Yeah. So 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 let's just put them uh, both together. But so, anyways, um, the the video viewing experience is the closest thing I've ever gotten to a theater because it you you're just sitting in front of this giant screen, and it's not like watching it. It's really hard to explain. It's give me a second. It's not like just sitting in front of a TV. It's very much like you're sitting in a dark theater, and that screen is filling up your entire field of view, and you can look around. And you can see the stuff very dimly lit by the screen next to you. And with your nice headset on, you get the full loud surround sound experience. It's really great. I've sat in bed or on the couch in my office and watched <clears throat> Netflix shows or uh, you could just watch straight up videos off of your phone. Sounds like your kid needs to get an allowance just to sit behind your chair and kick it every so often. <laughs> Yeah, just to get that uh, yeah, full theater experience. Yeah, get the rest of the experience. And it's really, really good. Like, this is probably going to be my favorite thing to do on planes now. And I don't care that it's I'm not it sure if I want to know stupid. what your favorite thing was before. Read books. Um, so those two things are great. Workspace efficiency and watching videos. Um. And then, you know, the fact that you know that you're on a phone is kind of kind of takes away from the experiences. The The video viewing apps don't really suffer from that. Um, it's mostly in games and applications where you can really tell. Anything where the screen is really white makes it easy to see the pixels. So general web browsing and YouTube watching and things like that, using it, um, it uses just a very white background, kind of your standard web page background, and you can really tell. And that gets a little, a little old after a while, and really causes eye strain. Like watching a video, um, does not cause eye strain for me, but staring at a white background where I can see all of the pixels does cause a lot of eye strain. Uh, if I'm watching it, in other I, words, I, never watch uh, the new Star Trek movies. No, definitely not. All of the lens flares will give you an aneurysm. I uh, just uh, skip the gear VR and just uh, strap a spotlight to your head. Pretty much. Uh, Turning into your eyes. <laughs> so I can sit and watch a, a Netflix, you know, a show on Netflix for an hour or two or a full feature length movie and, and not really experience any eye strain. But after about 20 or 30 minutes of web browsing, I'm, I'm starting to get a headache. So. All right. Well, this does kind of tie in. Well, uh, I actually have a couple of questions that tie into this, but battery life. Um, Because this is completely wires free, isn't it? There's no power going into it it's all powered by the phone right yeah it's completely powered by the phone um the galaxy s8 plus has a 3500 milliamp battery that brand new you know my phone will last for about two and a half days under normal usage that's me listening to podcasts pretty frequently making a few phone calls a day a lot of text messages some light web browsing it'll last two two and a half days uh it might last six hours with the headset on which was better than I was expecting, but it's still a huge battery hog. Uh, it, it's good enough to make it through a flight, but your phone's going to be pretty close to dead on the other side. And you can't, you can't, there's no pass-through connector or anything. You can't plug it up to charge it. If you need to charge your phone, you have to take it out of the headset. That seems and, like a huge it. oversight. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd love would, to be able to hook it up to power. Or even have the Gear VR have its own uh, battery uh, pack in it and have that be rechargeable and it uh, charges the phone as well yeah yep there's that and the fact that it gets real hot in there it gets real hot oh, right. um, I, I didn't even think about the heat because i know whenever i'm using uh, mine which is the uh, tier below yours or the version before uh if i'm uh playing a game it gets a little warm i mean it's not you know it's not amd hot but you know it it's definitely warm, and I can only imagine uh, in the headset, uh, I, uh, they can't really do any ventilation easily without you know letting light in from no, certain angles. And it's a double whammy too, because you get the the heat build up from wearing the headset and keeping yeah. that portion of your face trapped inside, 
and you get the heat put out by the phone. So because you know, in other if words, you're if you're playing Little Inferno, you have that interactive experience of the heat. Yeah, you would. Um, it's again, it's not too bad if you're just doing work stuff or watching a video. Your phones aren't really using too much processing power, but playing games. Um, 15, 20 minutes, and then I gotta take it off because I'm starting to sweat. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I guess uh, that prevents uh, simulation sickness because that's what, what I was going to ask about. Yeah, so far I haven't experienced any simulation sickness, uh, even from playing things that are like, check out this vomit-inducing game demo, or check out <laughs> this vomit-inducing experience. It's like, no, I'm not feeling it. Like, I mean, this is kind of like trippy, like my eyes are for the first few minutes or like what's going on but it doesn't make me feel sick which yeah, I was kind of worried about because I get motion sickness pretty bad but VR doesn't do it to me at least not so far I'm actually a little surprised because that's been the one of the major thing well it's been uh, the screen door effect which is something that you've already mentioned and uh, simulation sickness a lot of uh, people complaining about it yeah and, and I, it, it I, may just be you and uh, I know uh, in Japan I think it's Japan that uh, the uh, or the medicine that uh, helps prevent uh, simulation sickness uh, is just it's sold like candy almost. People uh, take it like crazy because they're addicted to VR. Yeah, I've there's only been one game that made me even have like a little flutter of of upsetness in my tummy, and it was like this extreme roller coaster experience. Uh, and it took about 10 minutes before I started to feel a little bit queasy. Um, but, I mean, it was it's nowhere near the level of, for example, simulation ex sickness that I experienced when I watched Hardcore Henry. If you remember, I talked about that. Like, I was so sick, uh -oh, I had I to had, wait. I, I had a thought. What? Hardcore Henry on this. Oh, I should do that. I have Hardcore Henry uh, in my Amazon library of movies. I'm surprised you didn't. I don't know why I didn't think of it, yeah. I mean, like I said, I was just, like, rushing, like, try as many things as I can so I can talk about this on the podcast. Um, well, now you have your homework. Yeah, I'll do that this weekend. I'll watch Hardcore Henry on it. That I might just throw up everywhere. That might <laughs> happen, because Hardcore Henry really made me sick. I, I, dear listeners, if you remember, I think I was, I said I had to sit in the theater for, like, 15 or 20 minutes after the movie ended. I was so sick, I couldn't, like, walk or drive. Yeah, so. that's your homework. Hardcore Henry uh, and, the, um, and the virtual theater. I will do that. Yeah, just uh, Should I uh, text Katie to, uh, just to hold a vomit bag in front of you? <laughs> no, I think I'll be okay. Um, <laughs> games on the Gear VR so far have been pretty yeah, the, shitty. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a limited marketplace, isn't it? Yeah. That, that's something that I didn't even think of, uh, that it's uh, a mobile game uh, platform. Yeah, I've played... I haven't bought anything. I'm real hesitant to buy stuff. Um, like, I know that the free games are obviously, for the most part, going to be sh shittier than the, uh, the games or just you purchase. Demos. Or just, yeah, or just demos. But it's just like... Again, like I said, it's, this is a phone. So, it's... The games aren't going to look as good. Uh, even a lot of the experiences that are sort of cross-platform between the different VR platforms, you can tell that they're struggling on it. So I'm really hesitant. Do you think the phone just doesn't anything. have the horsepower? I think that's it. I think the phone just doesn't have the horsepower. It, it just it comes down to the point that, yeah, you know, it's a phone. Yeah. Um, I have played a few games that I like, though. I'm pulling up the store page uh, on my phone so I can actually see what they are. Um, most of the games, though, do come down to sitting in a cockpit and you turn your head to look at things and use the controller to, like, aim turrets and shoot stuff. Um, there's also a fair share of, of stupors where you just stand in one spot and shoot stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse you. Cox. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, and then there's a ton of, like, ex experiences well, as well. Well, like, here's the thing, is that those are meant to just prevent motion sickness in general because a lot of what motion sickness is triggering uh, off of is just the overall motion. Uh, you know, hence the name. But because you're uh, you know, either standing still and you know, turning your head, that's not really uh, your brain's not saying, "Hey, I'm moving forward." It's just I'm turning my head. That's not as big a deal. Or because you have that static image of the cockpit around you, 
you know, it doesn't have the, the same effect. One thing that really bothers me about this, and I don't know if this is just the Gear VR or if this is all VR headsets, because I haven't played the full release version of the Oculus. I, I used the DK1 and DK2, and, and then I haven't used the Vive. But I wasn't a big you Dr. Have, Tongue fan. You have no peripheral vision, which is really frustrating to me, because out of all of the things that my eyes suck at, I do have really good peripheral vision vision it's like 170 that's another thing degrees I never really, yeah that's another thing i never really gets heard was just uh you know uh, your field of view yep and your field of view is limited in most games to something around the 75 to 90 mark oh and the vomit inducing on pc yeah and it's not like when you're looking at a tv or a monitor where that your eyes can still take in the rest of the stuff around you and it makes it okay it gets really frustrating because i'm like I can't see shit. I have to turn my head so much. I should be able to see this stuff. Yeah, but here's the thing is that uh, that's going to be a, a limiting factor for quite a while because a lot of what you're doing with this is uh, you're seeing this through lenses and yep. you can't do a peripheral vision all that well. Nope. Worn well, at least, well, at least, well, at least with the current design, they have to completely redesign the headsets and include curved displays. And that's very expensive still. Yep. I mean, so, flexible uh, displays are being developed, but they're still expensive. And even just curved displays, you know, you're looking at a lot more expensive, you know, just a flat, even in LCD technology. Yeah. Um, there are some games that have a wider field of view, but I mean, it's pretty obvious that they're doing that to limit the amount of stuff that the phone has to process while you're playing it to try and make it play smoother. Oh, the console uh, trick. Certain games that uh, don't do have they, to worry about that. Do they also uh, put a big weapon on uh, your screen? <laughs> Some of them do, yeah. That's another trick that uh, consoles use to try to just uh, limit the amount of processing that they have to do because that's essentially cutting out a chunk of the screen that they don't have to process. Yeah. Uh, anything that's hidden behind the weapon just isn't rendered. Yep. So that's less, you know, that's depending on the game, uh, you know, could be upwards of a quarter of your screen. If it's just an absolutely massive weapon model, which some games do that. Yeah. Granted, it's so, usually about 10 to 15%, but that's still a significant chunk. Yeah, the best game that I've played so far that's like that is called... Stupor 3. <laughs> this time, it's stationary. Oh, it's super generic. It's just called Space Battle. And it, your ship has got two guns on either side of the cockpit that take up probably 40% of the, your screen real estate uh, between the two of them. But it's the smoothest playing game because, I mean, I, I know it's, that yeah, as well it's as you do. Trick. They're not having to render as much going on. So, and I mean, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, I, Jim, I'd love to hear from you on this one, uh, what the field of view is like. Please, on he the, can only be so erect right now. On the Oculus. I know that you've got the, the Oculus, I think. Yeah, you got the Oculus, not the Vive. So just, what's the field of view in that? The the When you're just in the menu or watching the theater mode or whatever, I'm, the field of view is somewhere around 110, 120 degrees. So that's that's all right. But in games, it really narrows you down. So just uh, curious what the overall is for that. But the games that I've played that I actually really like and that so far work really well, uh, the first one's called Angels and Demigods. It's a, a visual novel actually, um, that uses the headset in uh, the VR environment in a couple of interesting ways. Uh, there are the, all of the scenes are wraparound. So sort of the main action is going on in front of you, like the main characters that you talk to, but you can look around to see more of the scene. And sometimes the, the characters have been unreliable narrators, or they just straight up lie to you. And you can turn around and look behind you and see something that, that they're denying or don't mention and interesting uh so it uses that in an interesting way um i'm hoping that there's as i get farther into it that there's more characters to talk to if you actually uh, look around your peripheral and kind of explore the the vr space um which i i think that's pretty neat plus it's just gorgeous and it's one of those things it's like you're just like floating in space and just looking around and it looks super cool the other is called bait and it's a fishing game and it's and a, a lot of fun. At it. It's a lot of fun. Um, you're this 
fishing guy that works for an aquarium that goes out and catches exotic fish. And the first level is in like the Amazon rainforest. Uh, and you have to catch a number of rare fish and it's got other levels that you can go to and locations and it's just a lot of fun. You use the, the, you know, you just look around with the headset, it's really gorgeous. It's got a cute art style, uh, not too realistic, but not too cartoony. You use a controller to, to flick your fishing rod and reel stuff in. It's good fun. Good fun. Well, I can't really pick on fishing games because I like fishing. I know. I know. I knew you'd like that. It's a very relaxing uh, thing. It's just a lot of games don't do it well, or it's very shallow. Yeah, and it's it's a game that uses the VR space pretty well, too. Um, there's stuff around you, like you've got a radio that you can interact with and turn off and on and set the station, and um, you've got like a, a phone you can pull up that... Tell me, do they ever tell you, if you want to listen to the station, you must pay? So far, that hasn't happened. Um, you can, basically what you can buy... Um, is like I mean it's a stamina system. It's you can only fish for so long, and then you have to take a break. But you buy energy. You can only drinks. play with your rod for that long. Yeah, you can only play with your shaft for so long. Um, but you just buy like energy drinks or coffee or whatever, and then you can. Fish well, for it's nice that they actually you know, uh, theme it. Yeah, because that's the thing is that usually it's a little bit immersion breaking. So it's uh, nice that they're saying you know. Well, uh, yeah, I'm feeling tired, but I could, uh, yeah, drink some coffee and uh, yeah, uh, fish for a little bit longer. Yeah, you can also buy premium baits. Um, uh, I, I, maybe it's just me being evil, but I would love to see if you're still fishing when your uh, stamina bar uh, yeah, just completely goes away. You just uh, fall asleep and fall into the water. And you see your fishermen just wake up and you know, clamber back in the boat and say, all right, it's time to go home. <laughs> Yeah, so I've got... Can't believe that happened again. <laughs> I've got like 15 more apps and games to try that I just haven't gotten to yet. I probably have gone through 15 or 20 already. But I mean, all of the games really just fall into the same two or three categories, at least on the free, right, well, free side. Well, I have uh, two more questions that I don't think I've co- uh, asked and I don't think you've covered. Okay. Uh, and I realize that you got this for free, but I'm still going to ask it. Uh, um, keeping in mind the price tag, I think it's a hundred bucks. Uh, uh, if you didn't get it for free, thereabouts. Yeah. yeah, it is. Is it worth it for the experiences that you've had so far? Hmm. Hard to say. Hard to say. Um, I think, I think it is. If you're not expecting to play games on it, I think if you're purchasing this as a, a sort of a Something you throw in your bag with you and take on a on a trip, so that you can you know like on a plane or on a, a long bus ride or whatever, or a train can, or automobile. Yeah, planes, trains, and automobiles. You know, have something to, yeah, you know, a, a new way to experience media. Or if you're looking for something to have, um, as like a a talking piece, a party piece in your home. Because at our at our um, at our housewarming. All of our friends, like, we were talking, and I mentioned to one of them that I got the Gear VR, and he was like, oh, I've been wanting to try a VR headset. And so, for, like, an hour or an hour and a half, uh, uh, everyone that was there was like, let's try on the headset. And the, uh, it's got this thing called, like, the and Oculus. now everybody has lice. It's called, like, the Oculus Demo or something like that, and it just, like, teaches you how to use the headset, and it's got some really, really cool-looking scenes with, like, dinosaurs and stuff. And just everybody ran through the demo, and they're like, wow, that's really cool. Like, as a party piece... Um, that you use to watch movies and do work on, I think it's worth it. If you're expecting to play games on this and really enjoy the games, I don't think it's worth it. So it's all about what you're expecting when you get out of it. Um, all right. Well, my other one is, uh, and I realize that battery is going to be a big problem for this, but do you see it being open to a more long haul gaming or do you think it's going to be more with the experience model of, you know, playing something for a little bit uh, or, you know, just, it's going to be your new Netflix machine. Um, not yet. This is still the first iteration of the gear VR as far as I know. Um, and while there have been several phones that have, have come along and have made improvements, the two biggest things are, um, the the screen resolution, your pixel density, 
and battery life. And those things still aren't there yet on this to make it a um, a long form gaming machine. Well, honestly, uh, I think for uh, the screen problem, they have to go to a 1440. Uh, yeah. Because uh, the way that they're going right now is they're staying at 1080p and just making the screen bigger. And that's going to make the screen door issue more yep. apparent. Yep. Um, but, uh, but so that prevents it from being you. that. But as far as like, if you want this for like a, a sort of a high quality Netflix machine or something like that, uh, say you live in a small apartment, but you want to have a home cinema experience. I mean, this is perfect for that. You can easily get through a couple of movies with it. Um, so something that I, I haven't talked about yet, uh, it's, it's not very heavy. So it your head doesn't get tired holding it. The biggest issue is, like I said, it, it gets hot in there. <laughs> but if you um, are well, isn't if, it very light on uh, on electronics inside of it? It's yeah. mostly uh, just uh, talking to the uh, controller because it gets back uh, its power from the phone. It yes. has no uh, internal power whatsoever, and that's a lot nope. of weight. It would be the battery. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it weighs. Let me pick it up here. I mean, this the headset weighs maybe a pound, plus the weight of your phone, so two pounds, thereabouts, two three pounds, depending on which which phone you have. Um, so, uh, how tight a fit is it with the phone? I mean, could you uh, do you have to remove it from a case? You do have to remove your phone from a case. Um, right. I've got one of the hard. Uh, what are they? The tempered glass screen protectors, mm -hmm. and that's fine. Um, so obviously it would work with just the um, what are they? Those little stick-on screen protectors. Um, but you do have to take it out of the case. Uh, and it's not. There's actually room for well, this thing to was fit in there was, with the was, case was, on. But well, what, well, what I was thinking battery life was was get a a, you know, a battery case. But yeah, you know, can't fit it, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, there's actually room for this to fit in there with the case, but the uh, the connector where the, the phone actually plugs into it uh, is very small and does not accommodate ah. any cases. Um, so in other words, you may be able to change that with a little bit of uh, well, uh, electronic uh, wizardry or just you know, a third-person mod to it. It also comes, there are, it, it at least comes with one other adapter. So the S8 Plus and the default in the... Um, the headset itself is USB-C, but you can actually remove the connector and it comes with a different connector that is micro USB for older phones. Because so I think this supports, I think all the way back to the, the S5 line. So Yeah, I know mine is uh, supported in it. So, uh, so if they just I'm released... I'm just one burst behind. Yeah, if they just released a connector adapter to it that was that had more space in there, um, where you could actually slide a case in. I mean, my my phone case would fit in there. I mean, if you've got like a really big uh, otter box or something like that, like something that adds a lot of bulk to it for extra protection. Well, what about it, my case that I fit. have that's modeled after a 1980s phone? Yeah, that definitely wouldn't fit. Ah, oh, damn. <laughs> um, I mean, sure, it's heavy, but it, at least it has a good battery life. Yep. But so, anyways, it it's not too heavy on your head. You, I haven't really experienced any fatigue outside of you know eye fatigue, eye strain, uh, from certain applications. It fits well. I'm never afraid that it's going to fall off of my head. Uh, the straps that come with it to hold it on your head are adequate, and you can lock the phone in the case. I mean, it snaps in anyways, but you can leave it unlocked. So there's someone like you accidentally bumped it, or someone accidentally bumped you, or they were being like cheeky or whatever and trying to make you look dumb. Uh, you can lock it so that. Well, to be your fair, you already have out. the gear head set on, so you do look real dumb wearing this thing. I mean, you don't care when you're using it, but anyone that sees you is like, "Yeah, they look really stupid." But I think that no, I mean, no, no, just... no. I, I know what you need to do to fix this. Google okay. the eyes. <laughs> oh, that would be great. Yeah, um, that's your new mission, uh, Hardcore Henry, and get a pair of decently sized googly eyes and put on your Gear VR. Okay. Okay. And it. But you also have to tell me what Katie says whenever she sees it. <laughs> Probably that I look fucking stupid. Well, uh, then you put the angry eyebrows on it as well. So I almost, I almost forgot 
uh, VR porn. VR porn's real weird, guys. It's it's, it's real weird. Um, it's it, you looked at like I'm I'm a fat guy, so when I look down in VR porn and it's like these really chiseled abs and like this huge penis. I mean, my penis isn't like tiny, but I don't have like a nine inch penis. It's like yeah, I know that's, that attitude. I know that's not my stomach. I know that's not my penis, and it, it's real weird. Plus, they do lots of things that doesn't happen in other styles of porn, just because I think like they can get up close and they're using super high resolution cameras and things. Um, it's just weird. It's soup. I mean, it's right there in the middle of the Uncanny Valley. <laughs> um, it's just, it's unsettling. Because it's like, I this is not real. I know that this is not real, and that is weird to me. Because my brain, like, my brain is telling me this is real, but then also that it's not real. It's it's honestly not very enjoyable. Well, there's a first for Jared. Yep. I mean, it's alright if it's like, hey, you want to watch some VR porn? Like, yeah, sure, I guess. I wouldn't, like, turn somebody down if they were like, hey, you want to watch some VR porn? But... I'm not actively going to seek VR porn very often, if ever. Very often. <laughs> I mean, every once in a while, you know, it's like, yeah, I could, I could go for some VR porn. Let's see how it's coming along. Another issue is quality, actually. Um, it takes a lot of, of bandwidth to, uh, to use it at the, at higher quality levels. So it, if you're not like allowing it time to buffer or downloading the videos themselves and then playing them using the the video player, um, then you're getting a lot of pixelated people, <laughs> and that makes the Uncanny Valley stuff even weirder. Because it's like well, you're no, a no, 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 no. It makes it more realistic. You just make sure that all your VR porn is of Japanese people. <laughs> You look down, uh, it just see all the pixelization. It's like, oh, damn, that's realistic. <laughs> yeah. So I'm trying to think of anything that I missed. Uh, it's fine with my glasses on. Uh, my glasses, though, sometimes fog up independent of the VR lenses. Um, it, when that happens, I mean, just kind of lift the headset up for a few seconds, let some airflow in there, and then the fogginess goes away. But other than that, it's fine with my glasses on. Um uh, is there any other improvements that we haven't mentioned uh, that you could think of for the headset? That's my last thing. So, like, anything that could be done to improve the headset? Yeah, just in general. I mean, I know the big thing is probably uh, some sort of battery uh, pack on it. Yeah, if it had a battery pack, that would be great. Um, they could even do... The headset's big enough, I think, to incorporate, like, for example, two smaller batteries on the sides instead of putting it on the front. So that well, I was thinking the battery so pack would be on the back. You could do that. You could do that, but that would make the uh, the straps a little bit difficult to use. Um, I, I was just trying to think of uh, where to put it to like counterbalance the phone. Yeah, uh, I think two. I think two small battery packs on the sides, or even one small battery pack. So the right side has got some buttons and stuff on it, where that if you don't have your controller handy, you can still control stuff um but the left side yeah hang has... on while i dig in my ear to uh, turn up the volume yeah the left side though just has the oculus logo on it and it's just like plastic there's nothing there so you could put a small like i don't know a thousand milliamp battery in there that would give it a couple hours of additional battery life right mm -hmm. off the bat for any phone and that would go a long way to helping with a lot of the longevity issues I'd love to see some kind of improved ventilation. I know there's not a ton you can do with that because you don't want to let light in and things like that, but anything that they could do would help. Even if it's only like a 5 or a 10% improvement, that would go a long way to make I wonder uh, just how much they could use. do if uh, they had some sort of, uh, this is probably going to be terrible, but some sort of uh, uh, ductwork and fans. There is... Because uh, they could... Uh, not have it near the phone where the light would have a problem at uh, the intake i guess i should say i don't know that i considered that I considered and that's the that. only thing i could think of uh, without 
go in something like felt or something, you know, just where it would completely block out the light or, or you know, do well enough unless there's a spotlight over you. Yeah. But even then, you know, it, it's you, once you're blocking out the light with uh, that sort of thing, it's still, you know, limiting the airflow so much. Granted, it would let out some heat, but eh. Yeah. Um, but but it, then you're running into a problem of, uh, well, first of all, noise, because, you know, you have a fan on your head. Yeah, even a teeny tiny fan right there next to your ears, you could you could still hear it. Or even just vibration. Yeah. There, there has to be something. I mean, uh, that's probably a, a big thing for the Mark II is uh, some sort of cooling system. Yeah. Even if it, uh, I wonder, well, it already looks dorky enough. I wonder if some sort of heat sink. That would work. That would buy you time. I mean, eventually, with no additional ventilation, a heat sink would still. Well, well, heat have you it up, where but... the where the heat sink go, dumps to the outside of the uh, of the headset, and it's using the room's passive uh, uh, airflow. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you're not using the headset for hours and hours on end yet, but it's one of those things. It, yes, I realize it looks incredibly dorky, but they could work it into the design of the headset. Yeah. I mean, these things already look dorky enough. So what's you know, yeah, you ten percent more dorkiness. Yeah, 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 your, your, uh, your, your homework so far is Hargo Henry, googly eyes, and angry eyebrows for the <laughs> okay. for the VR headset. <laughs> okay, and, and that's and the only and the angry eyebrows are only if Katie mocks the uh, mocks it. Either okay. that or the sad eyebrows. Eyebrows are involved though. Okay, I got you. <laughs> um. Trying to think of any other improvements or anything right off the bat that I would make to it. I can't really think of any others. I, I just haven't used it enough to identify any other flaws or anything like that. So, overall, I like it. Um, so you approve? Yeah, I approve. Uh, I don't think that you should go for the Gear VR as a gaming platform. I'm sure there are a few. Unless games you on it are absolutely good. in love with mobile gaming. Yeah, if you are, then sure, go right ahead. But um, I don't think that that's what this is mostly for. I think this is mostly to be used as a way to um, get a, an improved media experience over so, standard other words, use of a Net phone. Netflix machine. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a great Netflix machine. It's a ga a great theater experience device, um, and I'm. There's got to be some good like workplace you know, apps. If I ever catch this, this in like a thrift store or something, I may pick it up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean I, I I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put a hundred bucks down on it. Yeah. Mostly because I'm cheap and I, uh, I haven't really used VR. I, I actually sat down and while I was thinking of these questions, I thought, when was the last time I used VR or anything even close to VR? And I came up with an arcade game in the late '80s. It was a, a uh, a, a 2D racer and it had this viewport on it. I couldn't find what it was uh, Googling it, but it had the parallax screen on it and uh, it did a decent job of making it look 3D. But, you know, that's 30-year-old technology. And yeah. I was intrigued by, the, uh, by Nintendo's uh, attempt with the migraine machine. <laughs> yeah. This is done very well. I mean, I know obviously that I'm wearing a headset, but it's but maybe that's why I'm so, uh, you know, uh, poo pooing this so much is that, you know, I I've encountered the old uh, technology and it's like this again. So, okay, so here's what I have to say about it. Oh boy. I would have bought it if I had, I, I would have bought this if I had tried it beforehand. Uh, I mean, I got it for free, so I have it. Uh, but if someone had been like, hey, check out this Oculus or this Gear VR thing, and I would have tried it for 20 or 30 minutes, then I would have went, all right, yeah, I'm going to buy one of these. And because I have now experienced this, I am going to buy a VR headset whenever the version 2 of 5 and or Oculus comes out. I'm going to buy one. So Gear VR has sold me on VR VR because I want to have something to experience these games in because there are a few games that I would love to check out in VR and I've been so skeptical because of 
of my experiences with VR before. I mean, I, like I said, I've used the DK1, the DK2. I was not impressed. But the Gear VR is about on the level of the DK2. So if this is like the entry point and it's as good as the prototypes from a few years ago, the version 1 releases of these things are definitely better than that. And the version 2s are hopefully going to make a lot of the improvements that the headsets have issues with now. So whenever the version 2 of Oculus or Vive comes out, or like some no other competitor that has these improvements built in, I'm I'm going to buy one. So, well, I think that's a uh, high praise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, depending I mean, on uh, how you view uh, Jared's, uh, you know, standards. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I, sure. <laughs> Take that as you will, but I am... I'm sorry. I'm just, sold uh, on VR I, I was talking about, you know, high praise, and I realized that you're a lot of an easier sell than me. Well, I'm an easier <laughs> sell than you, at least on, like, games, but, I mean, hardware is a different, a whole different ball game. I mean, you and I both have been very skeptical about this from the beginning, you know, but this has, has convinced me enough that I think that it's worth it, because there are a few titles that support VR very well, and they are all titles that I really enjoy. So, I, for me, I think it's going to be worth it. And having the workstation experience, oh, I'd love to have that plugged into my PC. Because there's no good way to hook a Gear VR into your PC. Yet. There's some kind of wireless hackery that you can do to, to make it work. But it's real complicated and it doesn't always work well. So, being able to just sit at my desk and have that workstation experience is going to be great. So yeah, now, which uh, that's actually a lot of software for the Oculus is uh, the, that workstation type of stuff. Yeah, and uh, virtual monitors I've seen a lot of. It's just about the same thing, actually. Yeah, I mean that is, I mean that's like I said, that's like my number one favorite thing is the 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 workspace, and then the media center after that. So it's cool. It's cool. I haven't taken it into the office yet. I'll probably take it into the office later this week or next oh, week. Oh, just remember, you have to put the Google Glass on it first, otherwise people will mock you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's how I feel about VR. And how are we going on time? Official We're time at the two-hour mark. Sweet. So then that means it's time for us to move on to our first news topic. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this is going to make up for the, a couple of short episodes that we've had, I think. Yeah, so uh, Valve hires Kerbal Space Program devs. Well, now we know why the Max Exodus happened. Yep, because this took place uh, a few months ago, around mm -hmm. that time. So, uh, where's my news article? I've got too much shit pulled up. <laughs> you need the virtual workstation. I do need the virtual workstation. Here it is. All right, so um, yeah, th this is uh, at least what's coming out so far is very limited news. They are teasing that there's going to be announcements later on, though. So, is Valve actually working on games outside of VR stuff now? Are we gonna are we gonna see a Valve budgeted Kerbal Space Program like game? Because remember. Valve has a history of getting these companies, or getting these teams, I should say, not companies, that have done really innovative stuff. Let's see. I, um, Portal. Portal 2. Yep. Or Portal 2's uh, gel system. That's a student game. Portal was a, a student game. I thought uh, Portal was, the original Portal was based on a like a Game Jam game. And they got uh, the team It was that. either a, stu a student game or a jam Game Jam game. I can't remember which. I, I, maybe just, uh, you yeah. Uh, putting those uh, two uh, terms together in my head. But, I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter all that much. They saw it somewhere and snatched yeah, it. Yeah, they saw essentially a prototype. Yeah. Uh, they uh, got the original uh, creator of Dota for Dota 2. Uh, they brought in several mod makers uh, over the course of Team Fortress 2's lifetime to add to the team. Yep. So... They have a history of doing this. 
and making use of that talent. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with the formal Kerbals. Yep. I'm in, and about them too, I'm in a, I almost said I'm in two minds about it. I'm not really sure if that's the right way to say it, but just like, you know, there was that whole scandal that came about uh, how that squad was not pl- paying people enough. and They were paying them on Mex- Mexican standards, uh, including the international teams. Yeah. So depending on who came over, they might be making a, a lot, lot of money. money now, especially compared to then. I mean, I don't yeah, know. I haven't seen pays, any but... actual names yet, but they, uh, uh, there have, has been some clarification saying that Squad is not joining Valve, and the core team for KSP is still there. Granted, I think the core team now is down to, like, one or two programmers. Yeah. But, so, you know, I'm I'm happy for those guys for finding an opportunity that will give them uh, the wages that they deserve. But. Yeah, it's going to be, uh, like I said, interesting to see what happens with this. Because I do not see Valve hiring these guys and just letting them uh you know do nothing in uh, the company and valve has not really released a full game since i I think dota 2 was the last full uh, core game that they released when did portal 2 come out portal 2 uh released ages ago it was uh, 2011 yeah it was before dota Dota 2 2. okay all right uh maybe csgo It, it uh maybe uh muddled on those two just because I don't really have interest in uh, uh, Counter-Strike, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go check my dates on that. Let's see. Counter-Strike Global Offensive was uh, 2012 still. Wow. August uh, 21st. And Dota 2 is 2013, so still Dota 2. But still, 2013. That's been four years. I mean, so, that was well. due to release a major game. And sorry, I, I really doubt at this point that we'll see Half-Life 3 anytime soon. I think Half-Life 3, if it's being developed, is just... Uh, it's going through the half or going through the uh, Team Fortress 2 phase of getting little uh, iterations done and then scrapping it... Uh, working on it over and over again. And at this point, I really don't see Half-Life 2, or sorry, Half-Life 3, or Half-Life Episode 3, depending on what release they do, uh, living up to all the hype. Half-Life 3, Jeb Edition. (laughs) Half-Life 3, you have to build the rocket. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So what do you hope that these uh, these devs from KSP are going? I would to be doing? love to. I would love to see a a, a space sim like Kerbal with Valve's budget, because that's a major limiting thing for Kerbal has been just you know how much time they could afford to put into it, and well, Kerbal is. I would say Kerbal has seen most of its sales done already. Yeah, I think that's a fair thing to say, especially since they sold for so long in early access. Yeah. So I, I see, uh, you know, them on the downturn. Uh, it really depends. Kerbal Space Program's major uh, uh, long-term development uh, from here on out really depends on how well their expansions sell. If their expansions don't sell well, I don't see Kerbal doing more than their first expansion. Yeah, I agree. And, and here's the thing is that Valve can do a loss leader or make it where I I hate using the term hacks, but let's go with it. A a Kerbal space program by valve or, you know, a a valve space program can live on cosmetics. Yeah. I agree. Even though I am a little hesitant with uh, some of the ways valve is, uh, monetized things with, how they would handle this, but it would be it would be interesting to say the least. And that's saying that I'm I'm not even a hundred percent sure that Valve would do a space program like uh, Kerbal. We may see something completely different because a lot of this was uh yeah lo- uh, Kerbal was uh, their first game uh, for Squad. Uh, before yeah. that, they were an advertising company, and they struck lightning with their first game. Yeah. 
So a lot of this may just be, yeah, taking that expertise and working on something completely different, even though I would still love to see something more substantial. It may not be there. It may be, we'll see the tricks that they learned uh, with uh, some of how the spaceships work in a future Valve game, but we may not see a Kerbal-like game from Valve. Yeah. That's the other possibility. And I think the stronger possibility, to be perfectly honest. Probably. I imagine them working on some other game. I'd like it to be, whatever it is, I'd like to be an original Valve property as opposed to uh, releasing a sequel to one of their other games. What, you don't want to see Heavy in Space? (laughs) No. I'm good without that. I'd love to see them do something space-related. Oh. Get me going in there. Um. I'd love to see him do something space related, but uh, not uh, not Team Fortress Space or anything like that. Something completely new. But yeah, it we'll would. See. Uh, yeah, and the way Valve's uh, structure is, it allows them to uh, really do what they want. So it, it's really down to the developers themselves, the ones that came over. And that's the thing; I haven't been able to find exactly who they got. Yeah, so far that's as far as I can tell. Being hush well. hush, yeah. And I guess uh, we'll have a follow up to the follow up eventually. Yep. Speaking of people that should be hush hush. <laughs> yeah. See. See. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see what you did there. Uh, uh, this is uh, on the docket solely because I cackled like a mad person when I saw this uh, <laughs> headline. Go for it, goddess. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Oh, let me try again. Goddess, an ongoing project, states Madman. Oh, sorry, states a 62, sorry, 22 can CEO. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. It, uh, it, first of all, Goddess isn't dead. Well, there's news. Because, yeah, I thought it was uh, dead. Created, they're talking more about Goddess as a mobile game, which... Uh, didn't they get a trouble uh, uh, with uh, going mobile to begin with? Let's see. Uh, Goddess, Goddess has been in trouble a lot. Wow, that's a lot of red. Uh, I just went to their store page just to see when the last update was. Yeah. Okay, uh, I want you to guess. Overall reviews. What is the percentage of positive? Uh, the overall number is 5,071. What is the percentage of positive reviews? Mm, 23%. 29. Yeah. Yeah, but recent, it's 19. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, damn. It's just well, not a just good play. game. Well, the thing is that it's... A mobile game that they released on PC. Uh, it's still in early access, by the way. That That's the thing, is that it's still in early access. After, let's, like, four or five years? Let's see. Uh, according to this, the last update... I, I'm, I'm worried to make sure, because there's a uh, uh, a curator that I follow that uh, follows uh, or reports on uh, abandoned games. Uh is the uh, do they not have a news tab on this? Was well, it been that long that they don't even have it? The news tab. <laughs> yeah, I don't see any. Oh no, no, there it is. Hang on. Let's see. Last update was well, it was a, it was a community update, it, but this was the Goddess Wars, not Goddess itself. All these updates are to Goddess Wars. I don't count that. That's a separate game that's uh, focusing more on the combat. Looks like the last update was in 2016 uh, to Goddess Wars. And that's still over a year now. Yep. And that was the game that they abandoned uh, Goddess for. Yep. Well, so they abandoned news- that too? Yeah, it looks like it. Their, uh, their, news, are, their, their news thing is just... All the articles say, where's Goddess? Where's the updates? <laughs> From various sites. Uh, it looks like 2015. 
Damn. That's longer than I thought it was. I was just thinking 2016, you know, early in the year. Well, that's a thing. Yep. So, um, if there, there's a reason why if Peter Molyhew even uh, thinks a game is a good idea, I stay away from it. <laughs> yeah. He's always had issues, but at least his games before uh, were Peter Molyhew is Peter Molyhew is like George Lucas. And uh, hang on to your angry letters, please. Let me finish. He needs someone to hold his leash. He has good ideas, but if he is allowed to run rampant, you get this. And also, I don't think George Lucas is nearly as bad at promoting his uh, stuff and uh, saying outrageous things. At least as far as I know. Yep. So, uh, that's really all I... I mean, I don't and, really have well, anything to contribute. Well, and, al and also, the, uh, the, the line, 22 cans is turning goddess completely mobile. <laughs> so, in other words, if you bought this on... Uh, uh, if you uh, supported this on Kickstarter because you wanted a god game on PC... <laughs> Sucker! Oh, all right. And I really feel bad for whoever uh, that guy that won the uh, Curiosity Cube. You know, Peter Mall, his previous project where he made the guy a god in Goddess Wars and uh, stiffed him the money. Or at least you were supposed to make up a god and goddess, and there was supposed to be this weird thing where eventually there would be different gods, and they would have some sort of uh, uh, pseudo uh, content c uh, control. I mean, it was an interesting idea, but it was from Peter Molyhew, so you know you should take that with a massive uh, Mount Everest size grain of salt. And of course, yeah, it fell through. <laughs> <laughs> because it's Peter Ron here. Yep. Okie dokie. Uh, which so think, topic do you want to go to now? Uh, well, I was going to say we, uh, we're we probably going to skip ahead to the uh, community corner. Uh, well, well, we have uh, Life is Strange. Well, hang on. Well, I mean, this one could be pretty pretty simple. Uh, they're making a Life is Strange too. Yay! Well, well that, no, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. Don't say Life is Strange 2, because they didn't specifically say what they're making. They're just saying there's more Life is Strange that's completely different. Well, they're making Life is Strange continuation <laughs> content. Yay! No, no, no. They didn't say that either. God because, damn it, uh, man. Just let me have this. <laughs> uh, oh, 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 I'm, I'm trying to temper expectations. I'm being the wet blanket that I am. Well, you're not going to temper these expectations. I'm going to keep saying yay. Well, here's the thing is that we don't know what they're developing, uh, so we're likely just going to sit here and uh, speculate for the next 15 or 20 minutes. They're making Life is Strange related <laughs> content. Yay. Is that good enough for you? Fine. I'll, I'll let you have that. Okay. Uh, but the reason why I don't want to say Life is Strange too, because that uh, implies some sort of a sequel or continuation, and they don't specifically say that. They say more in the Life is Strange universe, which could mean a lot of different things. And the way the Life is Strange universe works, well, who knows what that could be? Honestly, I would love them to say, we're not touching Arcadia Bay at all. The, the first game, we're, uh, there'll be a couple of mentions of it, but it's a completely separate story. And okay. I'm not even sure if I would want to depending on the ending you get. And there's going to be Life is Strange spoilers. I mean, we had the, you know, the <laughs> massive, massive spoiler cast <laughs> last month. But eh, just in case you're new to us. Uh, depending on the ending, you can have a continuation to the story with uh, Max and Chloe, but at the same time, you could have it where Max is dealing with, you know, uh, all the stuff that she's seen that never happened. So, yeah, there, it's very tough to do a satisfying continuation of that story without leaving, you know, half of the consumer base being like, what the fuck? Yeah. Particularly since the, 
a storyline where you save uh, Chloe and basically condemn the town. Uh, it was kind of, it felt like it was thrown together, really. It, it felt less fleshed out than uh, the sacrifice. To be perfectly honest, maybe it's just the fact that, you know, uh, the uh, save uh, a storyline or the state of ending was, you know, just a one cutscene while uh, the sacrifice was, what, about five minutes of cutscenes? Yeah, I I didn't feel like it was rushed. I just felt like that that's like as far as you could go with that. But I mean, I could, you know. I guess well, they could have shown it, what happened in the town uh, more than, yeah, you know, just drive through and you're gone. Yeah. Uh, but they could have ha they could have it where it's a you know, a separate town somewhere with different powers. That would be interesting. Yeah. And it's just more of uh well, talking about a game that we both really enjoyed. Granted, I didn't really enjoy the ending all uh, all that much, uh, but it's mostly because of. I think it's just that they ran out of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Coincidentally enough, right? Yeah. <laughs> it came about time travel and they're rushed. <laughs> and, I would. Uh, well, uh, if they do a connection, I think I figured out a, 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 the connection point that makes the most sense. Uh, and it makes a sense in universe. Even though the thing doesn't actually after thinking about it for a while after the podcast does it make as much sense in the universe uh, I, I, know, I know I'm double talking the everyday here is contest have it be another entry that's the uh, person that you're following and the new story and the reason why the contest doesn't make sense is the time frame <laughs> right because uh, Jefferson announced the winner Thursday and uh, the story only takes place over five, the course of five days, so you're flying to San Francisco the next day? Yeah. Yeah, you fly to San Francisco on Friday. I mean, granted, maybe it's just, you know, in that uh, alternate timeline, you know, it, it's, you know, he's not rushing, I don't know, it's because you're not dragging your feet, but still. Uh, but, uh, that's why, you know, after thinking about it, it's something that I should have caught in the originally in the podcast. But have it where it's a different entrant to that uh, contest, their story. And I think that's the, uh, if they do a completely different story from a different place, that's uh, the connection point that makes the most sense. Yeah. I'd love to see, did you ever see the the TV show Heroes? Uh, first uh, couple seasons, uh, then, uh, I would say, uh, until it got bad, but that was season two. Yeah, season one was the only really well, good well, season. Well, the, well, Heroes suffered from, uh, the writer strike. Yeah. Because, but, uh, they, they had a lot better storyline written out, or, uh, planned, but the writer strike made it so that they had to rush a lot of elements. Yeah. And then it just, uh, they were bogged down by those changes and it just you know, kind of snowballed. But anyways, what I'd love to see, and this is super ambitious and I do not expect this in any way, but I'd love them to develop a series of stories that had other characters with different powers that you controlled. Uh, and then eventually they come together and do something all together. I think if it was a different studio, I think they could eventually do that, but... Uh, the only other game that this uh, developer has made has been uh, Remember Me, if I recall correctly. Which also suffered from about the same issues of uh, Life of Strange's ending was that it uh, they didn't have enough time to flesh out the game as much as they wanted to. Yeah. yeah I'm just double checking to make sure that... I think Remember yeah. Me is the one where you... Yeah, you're uh, you're a venture, you're uh, essentially an agent that remixes memories, but that it's more of a 3D platformer, and uh, that element was only used a couple times. Yeah, which sucks because that's the best part of the whole game, honestly. Um. So yeah, 
I don't want to really speculate anymore. I've already been thinking about Life is Strange today, actually, <laughs> before this, before I even saw that this topic got put on the list. So, well, I uh, put it on the Discord whenever the uh, the first video uh, came out before any articles started uh, being passed around. Of uh, I just made Jim's day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But. Yeah. I mean, right. it's good to see that they're uh, uh, working more on this universe because they did do a very good job on it. Yeah. It's just, yeah, you know, where they go from here really is going to define, you know, if they continue working in the space without being bogged down by uh, more Life is Strange. Or if it's, uh, is, if Life is Strange is going to be that, you know, one hit wonder. Which I really hope it isn't. Yeah. I hope it's more than a one hit wonder to you. All right. Ready to move on to our community corner? I think so. Let us do it. This one's going to be short this week. Uh, no letters. Yeah, and only mailbag's empty. Only what? One or two tweets? Well, there was only one tweet which I didn't write down because it was Jim alerting us to uh, the fact that Valve has picked up the uh, Kerbal Space Program uh, team. Yeah, they captured Jeb, Bob, and Bill. <laughs> yep. Yeah, uh, poor Valentina. She's still working up for her squad. Are you kidding? She loves it now that those three idiots aren't there anymore. <laughs> she gets to die all the time. <laughs> uh, but thank you, Jim, for alerting to us to that. And that was in the uh, docket, so no need to really uh, talk about that. We uh, did have uh, quite a bit of traffic on the question of the week, though. Uh, kind of stole Amy's question. <laughs> right? That's fair. <laughs> What is the best bad game you've ever played? Chemist, I don't really get the concept of a good bad thing. If it was worth my time, it's just good. If not, it's simply bad. Under the, it has its flaws, but I could still recommend it, would be the Prince of Persia trilogy, because of the awful combat, I could just never call those bad. But, but I could just never call those bad. Which, I could uh, see that. Yeah, I get that. Let's see, Jim, Duke Nukem Forever, which I definitely could see that. <laughs> yep, good response, good response. Be cool, Buzz Aldrin's Race into Space, which I didn't recognize offhand, you know? Um, I'm familiar with that game, but I've never actually played it. Yeah, I do know it's on Steam, uh, and it's more of a management style for uh, a uh, space program. Uh, than what Kerbal is, which you know, I could definitely see that uh, working, but it also requires a lot more knowledge of the uh, subject matter, and it's also a lot more realistic, or at least from everything I've been able to just glance at. Yeah. So it's definitely an acquired taste. Groove, I can't tell if he's being cheeky or not. He said Saints Row. Saints Row, in my opinion, is is a pretty bad game. Uh, Just trying to do the, you know, copy Grand Theft Auto and well, be a also bit because more this is Groove, you know, wacky. yeah. Uh, and it, I think Groove just wants me to punish him and put him in the crate so he doesn't have to haul in RimWorld anymore. Sorry, Groove doesn't work like that. <laughs> uh, I will say, I do see where Groove could be coming from. That Saints Row can get very repetitive. Yeah. Because even in the story missions, it's the same basic mini games over and over again. Yep, that does get old. But it's also. Uh, Saints Row relies on uh, some more of the crude humor and shock value that uh, GTA used to rely on before they went into characterization and talking about, hey, cousin, let's go bowling. Yeah. <laughs> uh. And let's see, Kyle uh, uh, gets in a little bit of an argument. Uh, Alpha Protocol, which uh, triggers Chemist to want to fight him. <laughs> uh, and then Kyle responds, Chill, friendo. It was just a fun game that had some flaws due to the complexity of what they were trying to pull off. 
Plus, I really like this one. And I have played Alpha Protocol. It, I definitely see where it's flawed. It is very clunky, mostly because they're trying to throw so many different elements in the game. And it doesn't do anyone particularly well. It does them well enough that I can't call them bad. But, yeah, I could definitely see where it is a very flawed game. Yeah. And that is it for the question of the week and the community corner. If you have uh, anything that you wish to add uh, to the show, uh, you could email us, vglpodcast at gmail.com or tweet us, vglpodcast on Twitter, which has the question of the week pop up Fridays sometime in the evening. Usually it's a little bit random. Just to annoy Jared. Yeah, I don't pay too much attention to that anymore. Am I going to have to change the time of the show again? No, don't do that. To be fair, I think Daylight Savings Time did that on me anyway, but still. Don't do that. Don't change it. It's perfectly fine the way it is. <laughs> because that does annoy you. Indeed it does. Got you heard. It releases five minutes before the hour. That's not so bad. If it was like three minutes, then it would be kind of bad. Hang on, changing it. <laughs> uh, All right. Maybe not. Uh, we'll see. Yep. We'll, we'll see if you need punishment. Nope. <laughs> so let's Speaking move of on. punishment. <laughs> let's move it on over to our Steam Weekly Discovery Queue. Yep. Go and, for the uh, theme song. Yeah, and I have a good one right off the bat. I can see it before I even click. All right. What you got? Oxygen not included. Uh, okay. Clay's uh, essentially answer to uh, essentially RimWorld. Uh, well, uh, a two D RimWorld uh, management base management game. Uh, uh, I should say base management game because that's essentially what it is. It is an early access though, and it is something that I would pick up probably eventually. Okay. Uh, it's uh, it does have. Uh, Clay has this style of being uh, of not having a style. All their games are pretty unique. Granted, I think this is the one that's been closest to what they've released before. Uh, it looks a, at a glance a lot like Don't Starve, just because of how their art is. But it's gotcha. also a little bit interesting that it's uh, instead of uh, Rim World, where it's top down, you know, spread out on the, a, a essentially a plane. It's a uh, vertical uh, 2D. So you can go down deeper into the planet and mine, which I just sold it to Jared. <laughs> I've, I've seen Oxygen Not Included before, and it's never really been on my radar. Like, I mean, it's, it doesn't look bad, but it doesn't look super well, great to well, me. Right either. now, uh, at least from everything that I've heard, granted, I'm not sure how much they've done since uh, it originally released I heard that a lot of it was still very bare bones granted it uh, does beat Space Base DF9 but then again a wet doodle beats uh, <laughs> Space Base DF9 fucking telltale right, anyway right. Uh, that's uh, Oxygen Not Included uh, essentially if you want a, a, a I guess you could call this a sci-fi sci even though it's more fantastical uh, th that's your option if you don't like RimWorld or, you know, if, uh, see me play and uh, been completely turned off by it. Yeah. And, uh, uh, how is this game relevant to you? Similar to games you played. RimWorld, Cities, uh, Skylines, it's rated very positive. It's in the top sellers. Six of my friends won it, including Jared, and three friends own it. Cool. Well, uh, I had to go through six games before I got to one that looked interesting, uh, and it is called Lacuna Passage. Have you ever wanted to play a video game version of The Martian? That's basically what this game is. Uh, based on the description, you are uh, a NASA astronaut who's stranded on Mars, and you have to survive by finding uh, supply caches that have been dropped around, and other people who currently are also on Mars, I guess doing the same sort of thing, it doesn't really say. Uh, and you have to survive and craft and things like that, so... It's uh, like essentially a sci-fi subnautica, almost. Yeah. 
Yeah, I get that vibe too. Um, but, yep, I'm gonna be all over this. I've actually requested a key from the, for this game on Keymailer, but I don't know if I'll get it, because I'm so low profile. But, hopefully I do. If not, as long as the reviews are good, uh, I'll probably pick it up in the near future. It is early access right now, so, uh, someone may wish to wait on that, but I'm not really too bothered by the early access. Uh, is this game relevant to you? This game doesn't look like other things you've played in the past. As such, we don't have much information on whether or not you might be interested in this game. Which I find that fascinating, because I have quite a few survival... Uh, yeah, it doesn't type trigger games off a list. lot of things. Well, well, well mine's uh, probably even worse right now. Uh, Mages and Mysteria. It looks like an action... Uh, uh, RPG. Uh, I don't want to say Diablo-like. Uh, well, let's put it this way. How this game relevant to you? Skyrim and Magicka. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, has a very... Uh, I don't want to say shell-shaded sh uh, art style, but it has a very bright and uh, uh, art style that looks very cartoony. And people confuse shell-shaded with cartoony art styles all the time. But it looks like it's doing fairly well. It does look like the biggest thing is it's a short game, at least according to some of the reviews. And I don't see just how long this game is, which, yeah, different people have different impressions of short games. Yeah. Uh, so I got another one. Uh, Rails to Riches. This is a... Well, we know uh, why it's recommended to you. This is a, uh, a board game, it looks like. Um... And it's just a Steam version of the board game Rails to Riches, which I've never heard of before. But it looks sort of similar to Ticket to Ride, I think. Regardless, I mean, yeah, it's a train game. So obviously, even if it's a train board game, I'm all about it. So, um, okay, And it yeah, recommends he, this to me because I've played Tharsis. Uh, well, here's one that's probably going to be for uh, you more than me, even though... Uh, I think this is going to solve uh, a major problem I have with a particular game. Production Line. It's essentially a yep. tycoon game mixed with Factorio. Yep, I think my main my problem with already. I think my main problem with Factorio is that it you don't really have a particular purpose outside of just making stuff. And maybe it's just I need the business management style of game uh, on top of it, which this does look like it does very well, Great, at least so far. It's in early access still. That, that, that's another early access game. <laughs> it, but here's the thing, is that similar to games you play, Empire TV and City Skylines, it doesn't mention Factorio. <laughs> oh, that's funny. But, yeah, it, it, it's one of those things that... I think I could get into uh, Factorio uh, with mods, or maybe after a few more uh, patches, uh, just let them balance out things. Yeah. And, I, and if I don't get burned out by other people. <laughs> well, but giving me a destination, I think, uh, would really help out. Yeah, well, Factorio sort of does that, but it's so far towards the end. Like, basically yeah. everything you're doing is working towards building the rocket, which is a goal, but, I mean, that's 40 or 50 hours if you're... I mean, even yeah, I this can't is get more, it much faster than that. Yeah, and this is more uh, yeah, overall business management, yeah, dealing with other things as well. Right, so you've got a lot of smaller goals instead of just one big one. Uh, I've gone through my whole queue, and I only had those two games, so it was a... Uh, yeah, I had a couple semi-interesting ones, but ones I didn't really want to talk about, and I am done. Sweet. Well, uh, that's that's still pretty good. You got three, I got two, mm -hmm. so not too shabby overall, especially considering how many games that we own, and me in particular, how many queues I've gone through before we even got to this process. So, pretty happy with that. Uh. That means we're on to the portion of the show where I go first in talking about my stuff. Uh, like I said last time, I had two full weeks of Divinity scheduled, so there's still that. Oh, I am trying not, so I'm going to be quiet. Keep going. Okay. Uh, I am actively working on 
uh, my next project, which is going to be a Let's Play project. I've currently recorded two episodes. Um, I'm not going to say what that is just yet, though. I want to get a few more episodes in the bag before I post them and start talking about it. But I've got two episodes completely recorded and recorded it. Recorded. Recorded. Recorded and edited and uploaded. Like, they're all ready. I just want to get a few more before I start putting them in the pipeline and talking about them. Uh, because my life can be a bit unpredictable, and sometimes I just drop off. So I want to have as much of a backlog as I can before I really get started. I'm also working on a couple of reviews. Uh, one of them is for Naval Ops Commander, because uh, I've talked about it a whole bunch. And I've never reviewed it, and I was like, you know what? I want to review it. That's my channel, and damn it, I can do it if I want to. So I am. But that's, that's, actually, a, party. that's actually a difficult game to review because there's a certain amount of history you have to have with the series to understand some of the things. So, like, the first full page of the script of the review is like, so, yeah, you have to understand a little bit of history before I can review this game. Here's the history. So I haven't actually got to the review part yet, but I'm working on it. Uh, I'm also looking at doing some content uh, for a couple of the key mailer games that I've played. I haven't actually done anything yet, but I would like to do a video Oh, about... this counts. It does count. It does count. But I would like to do a couple of short videos on um, Smash Pixel Racing and uh, Rocket Wars, just because I actually really like those. And so even the teeniest extra bit of exposure I can get for, the, for those games might mean an extra sale or two and some money in the pocket of well-deserving devs. I would say that as well, but I think that requires people to watch my content. Yeah. So uh, so there's that, and many other projects are in the pipeline, but right now I'm really focusing on just those few things. I don't want to spread myself too thin and burn out before I even really get started. Uh, so all that's coming up my channel, and you can find my channel, if you're not subscribed to it already, by searching for Gaming Psychologists. I've gotten picked up a, a couple of subscribers over the last couple of weeks. I'm closing in on 100, um, so yay. Uh, if you want to follow me elsewhere, you want to see all the things that I tweet about, and I've been tweeting about more than politics here lately, although politics still feature pretty heavily uh, on my Twitter. Yeah, and occasionally I'm on there poking you as well. Yeah, poking the bear. Um, <laughs> you can follow me at JMA4707. I actually picked up three new Twitter followers today. So wow. So I'm pretty, pretty happy about that. Um and then if you want to watch me stream games on Twitch occasionally, uh, we're down to once a week regularly. I'd like to do some more kind of intermittent streaming on Monday or Wednesday nights whenever there's the, the podcast editing goes quickly or if I have some extra time on Mondays. But guaranteed, once a week on Fridays, you can do the, find that at twitch.tv slash jr4707. Uh, unless you're opposed, Rage, I think that uh, we should do Warframe again on Friday and see if we can yeah, that rope some fun. of our other people back into it. Um, join us <laughs> join us and then if you want to be my friend on steam where I accept join all us. friend requests expecting and hoping that you people are going to be cool because so far everyone has been really cool my steam username is jarthur4707 send me a friend request and I'll be your friend and chat with you and if you wish to let them know exactly what episode of the podcast you're coming from the password for this week, in honor of medical Uber, is Yutz. <laughs> That's a good one. Yutz. Yutz is a good word. All right, buddy. What about your stuff? Oh, uh, well, I am in a complete state of disarray right now because I got frustrated with Halo, and I'm still in the process of trying to figure out what I want to play. I've gone through three games, one of which just didn't work. One that felt like I was playing the store brand of a <laughs> of a soda that I like or pop, depending on the part of the state that you live in. It, you know, it's just one of those things that, yes, it kind of uh, is like this other game, but it doesn't feel quite right, uh, mostly in the level design. Well, I guess I'll say it. I was playing Batman Arkham Origins, and everything just felt a little off. And it felt like the level design just wasn't quite there. Which, you know, may just be my fault because I realized that Arkham Origins wasn't, you know, made by the same developers as the rest of the Arkham games. 
So it is the store brand uh, Batman game, essentially, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm probably going to spend some more time uh, working on that tonight. If all else fails, then you know I'll skip this week and try again for Monday. Uh, Halo is still, I guess, causing me problems. Grand, you know, it was also medical stuff that was uh, making me miss a day anyway because just recording schedules. Uh, let's see, RimWorld still is ongoing with Dingy. <laughs> I'm uh, actually finished all my uh, recorded episodes, so I'm going to be recording that likely tomorrow night. And I have to generate a new name list because I kind of ran out of names. I went through a name list of 26 entries. And my nice. current colony has, I want to say, 14 people now. <laughs> well, you know, there's been absolutely some loss. Oh, yeah, there's been some loss, uh, especially some kidnappings. I, I think it was Spaceman that got kidnapped at one point. <laughs> Poor Spaceman. I'm sure he's living uh, it up in the tribe, you know? Yeah. I'm sure they're not abusing him too much. I'm, well, look at it this way. Grievous probably getting treated worse. <laughs> Even though it does seem like Katie likes the smell of rancid uh, jambalaya. Or did I tell you about that? Uh, no, I don't think so. Katie and Grievous are a couple on RimWorld. Nice. Good for them. <laughs> Uh, but let's see. Uh, well, uh, uh, RimWorld's still going to be ongoing for at least until the colony ends. Uh, once Alpha 17 hits, I'm going to have to figure out what I'm going to do. I could probably end the game uh, uh, with a victory in the course of, I want to say, a week's time. You know, about four episodes. That's uh, getting most of the uh, required components. And honestly, most of what it holds it back is uranium. Which I can get. Uh, it's just, yeah, you know, uh, pain in the ass. Oh, I will say that the last episode that I recorded, just as I was finishing up, uh, you know, about five, ten minutes before the end, a volcanic winter hit, which is just an event I never experienced before. So this is going to be fun. Sounds uh, interesting. Yeah. The, the complete opposite of what we're dealing with in real life. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least so far. Well, who knows? Maybe we'll get a nuclear winner. And Divinity should be returning this week. Unless you want to hold off and build up some more content. I, I'll leave that up to you, Jared. Do you want to hold off and get caught up all the way and build up another week's of content? Especially since you're going to Texas? Uh, that probably would be a good idea. I mean, I haven't listed any of the stuff that we've recorded uh, since... Or, or scheduled any stuff that we recorded since... I've moved to my new place, so I've got four episodes right now of new stuff. All right, and I still have the last episode out of our old recording set than the entire current recording set, so all right, so we'll hold off on Divinity for another week and start it up next week. It gives me another uh, uh, day, to, I guess, to try to figure out Halo's replacement. Halo's being a pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, do you have any requests that you want to see me play? I, I would uh, suggest they go into my library, but I, uh, well, tie a rope around yourself first. <laughs> I don't know. I'll I'll take a look at it later and make a suggestion. Well, you do have to realize that I have to uh, record tomorrow, right? Because I also have to do RimWorld. I see. Well, I'll try and get to it soon. <laughs> first thing in the morning after I've had. Well, some so sleep. if Jared disappears, um, uh, I would say. Uh, go look at my library and just follow the smell. But, uh, yeah, some of the indie games in there are kind of stinkers, so th that may not work. Considering I have two copies, or uh, two versions of There's Poop in My Soup. <laughs> yes, they made a sequel. Of course they did. <sighs> and, of course, the Sunday Sampler, which, well, as I talked about a couple hours ago, was uh, Tomboys Need Love too, and I think I knew what I'm going to be doing for this week. And it's something of, uh, uh, well, not as niche a game, I think. 
it looks very, very interesting. But the Sunday sampler is going to have trouble coming up because we have the Steam Summer Sale coming up, and that's usually, you know, dries up the game. So I'll be going to the backlog, and I'll likely, you know, put out some uh, a list of, you know, games to look out for you know, after the Summer Sale hits. And you can find all of that, including this podcast, on my channel, Gaming with Caffeine Rage. And if you wish to see me tweet somewhat randomly, uh, me getting angry at Bethesda, <laughs> well, I think was the big one uh, last night, uh, you can find that over at Gaming with CR on Twitter. And, well, since you're in the mood of uh, following us and uh, contacting us, you could also reach us once again. Uh, it's VGL Podcast at gmail.com with your letters, voicemails, or gaming related topics, or news topics since. Uh, Jim also commented on our Twitter page, which is VGL Podcast on Twitter. If you wish to help pay for this absolute madness, you could uh, do so over on Patreon, patreon.com slash VGL Podcast. And if you're not listening to this on our RSS feed, you can find it over at VGLpodcast.podpeam.com, which has our show notes with the timestamps if you wish to avoid all our nonsense, but then again, you're probably not at this point in the podcast by that uh, if you're wanting to skip that. And as well, we're on iTunes and Google Play. Our intro and outro music is on the crown, and our Discovery Cube music is doobly doo, both by the royalty free god himself, Kevin McLeod. And you can find his work at incomputech.com. And as always, as his lovely music starts to roll across my voice, but why now? Once our yachts is oh, the st- stupid motherfuckers. <laughs> bye bye. Okay, I'm back. Welcome back. And I was right in my water. I had just enough to last the first uh, break. Yep, I got plenty of water left. I held off on drinking it because I knew that drinking my coffee it would go straight through me, and water <laughs> would only make it worse. But now I'm having some of my water because I'm thirsty. Well, I emptied out the last of my water uh, into my glass and full glass and a full liter and a quarter of water. Nice. <clears throat> of course, if I was a cowboy in Steam World uh, Heist, they'd be very jealous of me right now. Because it's all steampunk. <laughs> it's steampunk western. Steampunk western. But I- I'm going to sell you on this game with uh, this phrase. Steampunk western 2D XCOM light combat. You have my intention. It's just, I, I played it, it was, I enjoyed it, it's just, I wasn't in the mood for a strategy game. But then again, yo, I'm in a very angry mood right now. So that's why I wanted to play Rage, and it just enraged me. <laughs> and not in a good way. Rage raged at Rage for making him rage. Angry noises! Why is everyone yelling? <laughs> so, what are we going to do topics list-wise? Because we're in hour 20. Well, I mean, we'll hit the VR and see where we are, and all right, we'll start cutting stuff and see where we are. Yeah, I think I was about right on our order of uh, cutting as well. Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. Yeah. The only reason why I put the Harvest Moon on, by the way, was this is the first Harvest Moon to come to PC, as far as I could uh, find out. I thought there was one more Harvest Moon game that was on PC. Maybe not. Maybe I'm thinking of something else. Maybe you're thinking of Stardew Valley. <laughs> nope. Definitely not thinking of that. But it's probably another game that's like a Harvest Moon clone or Harvest Moon inspired game that's on Steam already. Well, let's just put it this way. Whenever I search Harvest Moon on PC, it's all the, you know, are there any games like Harvest Moon on PC? Uh, 
Let's see. What games are like Stardew Valley? Yeah, literally everything I'm finding is this uh, game that's coming out. Oh, no, hang on, hang on. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, oh, I hate sites that do this. The, they put a rating in for their expectations of the game. So it shows up on uh, Google as a rating. That's stupid.